Talks. Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Today is Friday, March 29th, 2024. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Black Hollywood is mourning the loss of one of the finest actors of his generation, Oscar winner Lou Gossett Jr. passed away uh, in Malibu tonight. We will celebrate his life uh, right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Texas finally getting it right. An appeals court has reversed Crystal Mason's conviction and the five-year prison sentence for legally voting in the 2016 presidential election. Crystal and her attorney will be with us to talk about this long-awaited decision. This nightmare is finally over. Tennessee House Speaker Republican Cameron Sexton says Democrats had some backdoor dealings with dismantling the Tennessee State University Board of Trustees. We'll show you the video. A Michigan State lawmaker mistakes buses of NCAA basketball players as illegal invaders. These white Republicans are crazy. And a Minnesota scholarship named after George Floyd is being called discriminatory. I told y'all they're coming after everything. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered from the Black Star Network. Let's go. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop of Folks, we have lost another entertainment giant, Lou Gossett Jr., the first African-American man to win a uh, Best Supporting Actor Oscar for his role in An Officer and a Gentleman. He also won an Emmy for his role in the TV miniseries Roots. He has passed away. Lou Gossett was 87. 2010, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, uh, but has not been confirmed that if that contributed to his passing. Again, over the course of his career, uh, he has been in numerous movies, most recently uh, in the uh, new edition of The Color Purple. 
Uh, we, uh, of course, uh, had an opportunity to talk to Lou Gossett on many times. Uh, there are so many different movies that uh, he played in, TV shows that he played in, uh, you name it. Uh, this was some of what we talked about when we talked in December 2022 on Rolling with Roland on the Black Show Network. It's nice to be this age, very grateful to be unscathed, uh, broken legs and stuff, you know, no my sports injuries. And, but I've been given uh, the opportunity by God, I'm a God, God to, to be in Israel and Africa and Japan and Australia and Egypt and South America and Central America and Mexico, Canada in 80 years. There's no career out there that long. I have nothing to complain about. Mm -hmm. I wake up the next morning, you got me another one? Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. It's good to see you. I've been in the place where I, I was concerned, and it gets you angry, and then finally you take a deep breath. Oh, wait a minute. You can't do nothing about it except speak your mind and get mm -hmm. on with the day. But it's, uh, it's a good time to be alive. When you... Um How do you, uh, let me phrase it this way, what still excites you about either the stage, the small screen, or the big screen? What still makes you just, let's go? New talent. New talent. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, my favorite actress is Taraji Henson. And another one is, is uh, the girl that played my daughter in The, the Watchmen. Uh, I can't remember right now what her name is. King. And uh, there's some- Regina Re King. Regina and others. Writers, the director from, from uh, let's call it Purple, uh, Fantasia. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some people out there that's very exciting. And, and it's in, in all walks of life. Athletes, amazing. That kid, uh, from New Orleans, uh, he's, he's amazing. So, so when you do with these projects, so for you, it's it's being able to share space with this with this I'm, new I'm blessed. I'm blessed, and it's a mutual. I don't know. We don't have that kind of time, but I tell you, on my cell cell phone, all the thanks and the congratulations, the mutual family over the last couple of years that uh, I've been fortunate to to be around. The respect is there. They like it when we contribute some knowledge to them. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, again, 2022, uh, 2012. Uh, Lou Gossett appeared uh, with me on Washington Watch. We also talked to him later on News One Now. So, I mean, a lot of different conversations that I had with him. And so in 2012, uh, with TV1's Washington Watch, we had our Hollywood edition of the show. Uh, and this was that conversation. Obama in 2008 with money, support, endorsements, also hitting the campaign trail. What about this time? With me to discuss just how the president is perceived here in Hollywood are a number of great people. First off, Lou Gossett, Jr., Academy Award winner. Lamon Rucker, Tatiana Ali, and Keisha Knight Pulliam. Folks, how are we doing? Fantastic. All right, love great. it. Um, first of all, let me start off this way. Uh, it's been interesting reading some of the comments from other folks. Let's say Matt Damon has been highly critical of President Obama, uh, saying that he hasn't been tough enough, he hasn't stepped up to the plate. And so when you hear these criticisms, what do you think? And also, what's your assessment of the job the president had, has done thus far in the past four years? I think he's done a monumental job. I think the least of it is him being black. I think he's our president, right? He's, he's upset some black people because they didn't have programs for them. But he has been the president for the entire country. And now his record is beginning to show because unemployment is down, Wall Street's up, uh, Detroit's waking up, all his promises. And he, he, uh, he, he inherited a problem with a deficit, and he's doing beautiful. His next four years would put him in history books. Well, he, he's, already, he's already saying he's getting elected. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Go right ahead. Yeah. Um, I think you touched on some really important points. You know, President Obama was given a job that could not be done in the time frame that has passed. He needs extra time, not because he hasn't done his job thus far, but because the problems that he inherited were so great. Um, you know, I'm a very big, avid, you know, Obama supporter. I went to the Women for Obama luncheon where Michelle Obama spoke the week before last. 
past and I'm working with the campaign on college campuses and I feel like you know I think a lot of people recognize that you know there's still work to be done and he's the person to do the job. The next generation of young folks huge huge mm -hmm. part of his platform in terms of his support in 2008 We've seen young folks not particularly happy with the job the president has done. When you look at some poll numbers, uh, I speak on college campuses all across the country, and when I when I would say President Barack Obama in 2009, huge response. In 2010, pretty good response. In 2011, okay. And so it's real interesting. So I can always tell by applause levels how folks are feeling at the time. I think I, I worked on the campaign uh, last Yes, because you were in my book season. the first. Yes, you yes, were. Yes, and um, I worked, spoke on a lot of college campuses, and there's an idealism that uh, Obama's message really hit on that mm -hmm. spoke to young people. And I think the reality mm -hmm. of what he was confronted with is a very different thing. I'm really excited to see, and I kind of, I'm speaking it into existence. I think we all are. I mean, Absolutely. Mitt Romney, I don't even. Who? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> that can't happen. But um, I, I'm excited to see this second term because that's the real freedom. Absolutely. There's no, this is the second term. It's right. the last term. You don't have to worry about right. reelection. You can really go for broke, right. which is incredible because in this first term, he did. He has gone for broke. Health care. The economy is now making this upturn, and hopefully, no one's going to want to see a switch yeah, I think while things are, are finally going upward. I think that's what's key. I mean, you talk about the, uh, you know, the younger uh, demographic and you know the younger generation, which includes us. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Lucy, but, me too, me too. <laughs> but, so but, you know, <laughs> I think in saying that, I think this idealism is actually a, you know, a really, um, a really the perfect word. And unfortunately, based on that youth, sometimes you can be very short-sighted. Short I don't think you really understand the long-term ramifications and how long it actually takes yeah. something to right. evol evolve into what it's supposed to be. So I think once that it start, you know, that starts to be evident. There's going to be a greater appreciation for this last four years and the next four. But most of us are kind of really in this immediate gratification oh, phase that we expected absolutely. things to well, happen yeah. and turn it's around much faster than easy. they really can. Yeah. One of the things that, I, that we've talked about <laughs> on this show on many, uh, on many times uh, is that when it comes to making it clear what we want and desire. I, I've heard African Americans across the country, they say, well, Roland, we really shouldn't ask for certain things because you know, whites will be looking at it. And I say, time out. 95%, he got 95% of the black vote. Mm -hmm. Black women voted at a higher rate than any other group in America. I said, yes, he's African American. Yes, I said, but he's also the 44th president. Absolutely. My belief is that black folks, like anybody else, have a right to say this is what we want and desire because Absolutely. we also voted too. Absolutely. So what do you make though when people say, no, 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 don't do that because right. that, that might jeopardize the brother's right. opportunity. I right. And, 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 so and I've like, heard you know, this yeah. don't you from some no rabble 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 now. I, I mean, I've heard that from a lot of people. Don't you call it dynamic, Trump. though. This is a dynamic that uh, we might have forgotten about what JFK said. He said, ask not what this country can do for you, That's but right. what you can do for the country. We have an opportunity. You young folks have an incredible opportunity to be three-dimensional, responsible Americans and keep that man in the White House probably for another four years if it was possible. But it's not waiting for him to do a program for right. them. Right. It's, it's, it's the, the, the modicum of America, right. regardless of who you are is what you can do for the country. Right. And that's that what got him in there in the first place. And that act you know, brings the country together. There's been so much um, uh, pushback from Congress. It's been such a war mm -hmm. in, in Washington that, I mean, you literally see our president waging war against, I mean, or Congress waging war against mm -hmm. him. And he's traveling. He's, he's, he's had to go the route of traveling across the country and trying to mobilize support for the things that he's doing. Mm -hmm. What that means is that African Americans women, whatever segment you think you're in, we should be mobilizing and give him the pressure Amen. that he needs Amen. to get things yeah. done, to be able to go into yeah. Congress and say, look at what your constituents and, are saying. They agree with me. Change our perspective because this is our country. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't, you know, those people over there. No, we all make up this That's country true. and it is all ours and we have to take ownership of that and understand that when we vote, we are putting people in office to represent our voice. 
everyone's voice. Black, white, whoever, wherever you are. If you're an American citizen, they are, their job is to fight our cause. And we have to hold them accountable. We have to let them know, yes, we put you in office to be our voice. And, and you know, follow up. You know, not enough people are really proactive with that and really find out what's going on. Okay, what is this congressman, what is his voting record? Mm -hmm. right. You know, what, what has he stood for? Is it in conflict to what he says he stands for? Right. Or is it in actuality right. that he is doing what he says Those that he's doing? Now, 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 all okay. of you have said that clearly you expect him to be reelected, mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, one never knows. I will do is my part. It, I got you. <laughs> but, 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 but follow me here. But isn't it also important for black folks to demand that Republican candidates speak to our community as well? Because if they happen to be elected, they will also be president, Absolutely. as you say, of the Absolutely. entire country. Yeah, entire country. So, so that's the Republicans have to come to the plate. They haven't quite come to the plate yet because it's in the DNA. They have to make a larger adjustment to speak to us, I believe because that's the way it's been for generations. Mm -hmm. The Democrats don't have to, have to make such a, a decision because they have more African-American representatives. Mm -hmm. But the Republicans, you're absolutely right, have to be sensitive enough and compassionate enough to speak to us. But in the meantime, we have to be in that place where they can't do anything else but speak to us with the truth. Gotcha. That's our job. Final comment. Our the job, job of the young folks. Ten seconds. Yeah. I, I don't see, I mean, honestly, the Republicans have put themselves in such a corner with Tea Party ideology and, and, and morality that I, I think that's a really difficult turn for them to make. And it I don't is, know if I, that's going to happen. It is, but it I, must be made, though. It is, but, but I will tell you this. The way that it's made right. is by showing up and them having to respect the fact right. they're coming out. That's they're right. going to vote. That's right. And that's the only way. Your vote counts. And well, if they well, don't believe it, they're not going to worry I've about it. I've made you. the point very simple. Whoever the nominee is, that person should come on TV one, come on this show, that's speak right. to black folks. That's right. Because you want to be the president. You talk to us. That's right, baby. You got to come through the chat. I'm out of time. Luke Gossett Jr., always a pleasure. Lamont Ruckett, thank you so much. Very yeah, much. Tatiana <laughs> Ali, he should not pull him. Thanks a bunch. Tatiana's like, that ain't gonna happen. All right, folks. Uh, that was uh, a very interesting day because we also had another panel with Richard Roundtree, uh, who we lost last year. So two giants uh, we've lost in back-to-back -back years. Uh, just get some thoughts and reflections from our panel. Uh, Matt Manning, civil rights attorney out of Corpus Christi, joins us. Uh, of course, um, we're out of um, Detroit. I keep telling y'all, how do I keep letting Sigmas on the show? Michael Imhotep hosts African hey. History Network show. Kelly, years, Ke baby. Kelly Bethea, communication strategist. Glad to have y'all on. Um, you know, I, the, the thing that's, one of the things that's, that stands out, I think if you look at the career, Michael, of Lou Gossett, I mean, this, yes. is, this is somebody who, um, he was always about blackness, very much Afrocentric, uh, and, uh, and, and, and proud of that and the roles that he took. Yeah, yes, you can you could tell in some of his dress, uh, he, he was Afrocentric. Um, I saw numerous, uh, he had over 100 TV appearances, number one. Uh, that's Diggs Town that you're showing right there. It looks like that was Benny Urquidez, who's a martial artist also, kickboxing champion. Uh, they showed who's the referee. Um, it, you know, so I saw movies like Sadat, uh, where he played Anwar Sadat, yep. leader of Egypt, who was assassinated. Um, his most, even though he won uh, the Oscar in 1983 for An Officer and a Gentleman, he stands out to me for the TV miniseries Roots. I saw it when it originally aired on TV in 1977, aired at nighttime. I watched it with my, with my parents, okay? And we millions of people across the country watched Roots every night. We never saw anything like that before. And he brought dignity to the role of Fiddler. And uh, the New York Times has a, uh, his obituary today, and, and they quoted him as talking about, why choose me to play the Uncle Tom? This is what he referred to Filler as. And uh, he went on to say that he—but he, uh, he but he came to admire the survival skills of forebearers like Fiddler, he said, and based the character on his grandparents and a great-grandmother. So th this is a brother who we saw— on two roles on uh, Good Times, we saw on the Jeffersons, and uh, also he had a, a short-lived TV series in 1989, I think it was, Gideon Oliver. This is him on, on the Jeffersons. Very versatile actor. I can't remember of any role that he may have uh, played that maybe brought shame to African-Americans, okay? So this, this is a huge loss. 
Uh, it was always about dignity. It was always about righteousness, Kelly, uh, in terms of uh, what, how Lou Gossett wanted to portray himself on the screen. Absolutely. Um, to Michael's point of always uh, portraying roles that show dignity, no matter how possibly controversial he may have found them out to be. Um, one of my favorite roles, and Frank, probably the first time I was exposed to Lou Gossett Jr., was his role in Raisin in the Sun. Um, he was portraying uh, the love interest of the daughter, and he if I recall correctly, was uh, the more politically correct um, love interest of, of the daughter. And there was there was conflict there as to, um, you know, who was blacker and who was, you know, more for their people, et cetera, et cetera. And I was, ex when I looked at that, when I was studying A Raisin in the Sun, I, I gravitated to his character because I have a lot of people in my family, myself included, who had to struggle with that internal dialogue Myself, um, one of the last roles that he played that was one of my absolute favorites was when he was the grandfather of, of Regina King's character in Watchmen. I thought that was such a dignified, poignant role because even though he wasn't, uh, you know, he didn't have a whole lot of lines, but his entire character was the was the reason for her entire being. And it just felt very uh, almost foretelling as to how his legacy is going to be for other actors and other entertainers, other artists, that while he might not be here, his influence is so pervasive throughout this uh, industry, throughout this country, throughout this culture. Um, and he will be deeply missed. Matt? I think uh, Kelly and Michael covered it pretty well, but what I think is so extraordinary is that he had such a high level of output and dignity and acumen at his craft for 70 years, which is really extraordinary if you think about it. His first Broadway appearance came when he was 17. So for him to have seven decades on the screen and on the stage at such a high level of output is really uh, an extraordinary feat. And I think um, Michael's sentiments regarding Fiddler are a lot of mine. I actually just watched the original miniseries again for the first time because I just read the book uh, several months ago. And what I thought was so um, compelling about his performance is the Fiddler that he depicts in the miniseries is after Fiddler has already been, um, you know, basically taken advantage of by the master where he thought he was going to buy his freedom. And the reason that's important is I think he really embodied the uh, internal conflict that's in the book, in the role, in how he was caring for Kunta. And I just thought his, his performance was extremely um, compelling. So uh, there's nothing to, to be said beyond we, we've lost a giant, but I appreciate him being such an exemplar at his craft and showing us how you can have this kind of output for this long. Folks, we've got lots more to share with you with regards to uh, Lou Gossett uh, Jr. Uh, of course, um, at the end of the show, we're going to play the full interview that I did with him. Uh, I caught up with him on the American Black Film Festival, Festival Red Carpet. Uh, I, I, I caught up with him uh, in some other areas. So again, lots of stuff to talk about when it comes to Lou Gossett Jr. But coming up next, uh, Crystal Mason will chat with her. She finally, finally is free. It's been an eight-year ordeal that she has had to deal with and how Tarrant County prosecutors have been trying to put this black woman in jail. It is nonsensical. We'll tell you exactly what the appeals court announced last night. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. This is attorney Demario Solomon Simmons. I'm a national civil rights attorney. I'm also the founder and executive director of Justice for Greenwood. Many of you guys know I've been leading the fight with the last two living survivors and the Greenwood community overall. We have a historic hearing coming up on April 2nd at 1.30 p.m. in front of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. I need all of you to support us as we try to get justice for this issue for the first time in almost 103 years. Sign up to support us during this hearing on Tuesday at justiceforgreenwood.org backslash watch party, April 2nd, 1.30 p.m. We need your support, your messages, and your prayers. We appreciate you. Justice for Greenwood. 
Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. He stoked racial violence, attacked voting rights, and if reelected, vowed to be a dictator and, quote, get revenge. We can't go back. As president, I put money in pockets, creating millions of new jobs, and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, people can't live with them, can't live without them. Our relationships often have more ups and downs than a boardwalk roller coaster, but it doesn't have to be that way. Trust your gut. Whenever your gut is like, this isn't healthy, this isn't right, I don't like the way that I'm being treated, this goes for males and females. Trust your gut, and then whenever that gut feeling comes, have a conversation. Knowing how to grow or when to go, a step-by-step guide on the next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. This is Essence Atkins. What's the love king of R&B, Raheem Devon? Me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching. You're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. Folks, uh, we have been covering this story for years. In fact, uh, the first episode of Roland Martin Unfiltered, we talked about uh, Crystal Mason, what she has uh, endured in Texas. Uh, This started in 2016. That's how long this case has been going on. Uh, When she tried to vote in the election, she... Bottom line is, didn't realize that she could not vote. Folks, they have been pursuing her to send her to prison uh, since 2016. Uh, Late last night, the Texas Second Court of Appeals acquitted Crystal Mason, and she was facing five years in prison for that conviction. She and her attorney, Kim Cole, join us right now. Um, Crystal, free at last. Yes. Yes. Um, what was your reaction uh, when you got news of the uh, appeals court? Because they heard it a year ago. So <laughs> you've been waiting for this decision uh, for a year, and it came down late last night. Yes. When I heard the news from my attorney, ACLU, gave me a call, uh, I was overwhelmed, filled with joy, just thanking God for carrying me through this long seven years. This journey was very rough. And I'm just so grateful right now. I'm just thanking God every step of the way because I know this wouldn't happen for, if it wasn't from him. So that's where I'm at. I'm just so grateful right now. I'm so thankful for all the support that I have had on this journey. Thank you, Roly Morton. Thank you for covering my story every time you had a chance. Thank you. Kim, uh, absolutely. I mean, look, it, it, it was a case that that was just it was nuts from day one, uh, mm-hmm. and the stuff that they put you through. Uh, and for people who don't know, um, you 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 were out. You had served time in federal prison. You were out, and as a result of this, you had to go back to federal prison as a parole violation. Correct. As a a supervised release violation, yes. My supervised release in in my trial on... In 2018, he testified on the stand and said, no, we never told her she couldn't vote. No, she never signed anything. I was doing everything I was supposed to do. I came out and been productive in society, raising my business, my kids and everything. And I went to fill out a provisional ballot because I believe I had the right to vote. And I was sentenced to five years. And um, from that, the Judge McBride determined that I should go to prison because I caught a new offense. And they sent me back to prison for 10 months and gave me another 24 months on supervised release. So you were on supervised release. You have to go back here for 10 months. 
then they added two years to that. Correct, yes. And so, again, you had a job, you had a home, so now you, it completely disrupts your life. You come out, and then when you come out, Tex Tarrant County is still trying to pursue you. Correct. Absolutely. He, 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 uh, Kim, here's what, again, that's just, that, it just befuddled me from, from the beginning, that her ballot actually was never cast, correct? It was never counted. Right. It was never counted. No. But it, it was like, I mean, these prosecutors in Tarrant County, I mean, they took a, such a hardcore position, it was like, no, 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 we gonna, we gonna make an example out of this black woman. Well, Roland, that's what the prosecutor said in his summation at the trial. He specifically requested that the judge send a quote, send a message to the voters and to sentence Crystal to a stern prison sentence. Roland, make no mistake, the court's ruling today could have been made years ago. It could have been made in that courtroom the same day she went to trial. The judge ruled that the evidence presented in Crystal's case did not add up to her knowing that she was not eligible to vote. We've been saying that the whole time, Roland. Have we not? Yeah. We didn't know. She did not know. She said that on the stand that day. Their own witnesses, as Crystal said, the supervisor over the region of the Federal Bureau of Prisons testified on the stand. This was their witness. He testified. We never told her anything. So he testifies we never told her. She doesn't know. And they're like, damn that. We, we're sending her to prison. It was to send a message, Roland. Tarrant County is one of the largest. Matter of fact, I believe it's the only urban red district in this country. Yep. And their motto is to keep Tarrant County red. Period. It doesn't matter if an innocent woman has to go to jail. They had an agenda, and they wanted to send a message to the voters of Tarrant County. That's what the DA specifically requested. But, Roland, what they got, the message that was sent wasn't the message that was received. Mm -hmm. It ignited a fire in Crystal, <laughs> and she as well as almost every member of her family now are deputized to register people to vote. There you go. <laughs> Crystal, how, how did it make you feel when we kept seeing these stories, like this one right here, where a Georgia Republican Party official voted illegally nine times and all he got was um, a $5,000 fine? It was, it saddened me that you actually had people that really committed crimes. You actually had people that actually voted. You got, you have people that voted twice, two, three times up under somebody else's name. And yet it was, they were looked over. So I know exactly what the purpose was. Yeah, I mean, they, they, he, here's the NBC story. Uh, Brian Pritchard, first vice chair of the Georgia Republican Party and a conservative talk show host, was fined $5,000 for voting illegally and registering to vote while serving a sentence for a felony conviction. Pritchard was also ordered not to commit further violations to face public reprimand for his conduct, conduct and to pay the state elections board investigative costs. They, ba they basically did this here. For yes. you, this man voted nine times. Huh. For you, it didn't even count. They said, uh-uh. Stick this woman in prison. Roland, you don't even have to look to Georgia. In the same county, there was a judge who forged signatures to get his name on the ballot. In Tarrant County. And um, he got off of probation. Wow. 
Same county. And let's not forget, this is the same county where the affluenza teen case came out of. A, a young man committed several crimes, stole uh, alcohol, stole a vehicle, killed four people, and got off with probation. And, Crystal, um, you were in 2016. What Kim was talking about, go to my iPad. That judge... That happened 2018. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unbelievable. Um, the, so, so, Kim, is it all over? Or... No, it's not over. It's not over. Oh, no. Is the they, ca- they, they, they must. Oh, you're talking about the criminal case. No, no, right, 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 the criminal case. Okay. Uh, the criminal now, now, case... Now, can, can Tarrant County appeal this decision? They can. They better not. Because they did that before. We they they made the wrong decision years ago when we first appealed it, right? We had to appeal their decision. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals came back and said, um, yeah, you might want to take a second look at that because that's not what the law says. The law says that she has to know that she's not eligible to vote. And they found, they upheld her conviction saying that it was enough that she knew that she was on supervised release. That doesn't even make any sense. Who doesn't know their own circumstances? Right. <laughs> that's silly. So that's the standard they applied. So this, the Court of Criminal Appeals sent it back down. They remanded it back to the second Court of Appeals who made their ruling last night. They sent it back and said, you guys might want to take a second look at this because you... Uh, applied the wrong interpretation of the statute. Even though the statute clearly says that the person commits the offense if they vote in an election or attempt to vote in an election, which the person knows that he or she is not eligible to vote. You said this... It's in there. You You said said the person has to know. You said this is not over. What's next for y'all? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, Tarrant County cost Crystal and her family years of, I I would almost call it a terroristic act. Mm. She was a political prisoner for a while because she had to go back to, I mean, she had to go back to prison. Yep. And this was all behind a a political ploy. So Tarrant County owes Crystal Mason. And y'all gonna sue the county? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Crystal, there was a brother in Houston who voted in 2020. He waited six hours in line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They arrested him. Mm-hmm. He was found n- hadn't done anything wrong. He said this year, I'm not voting again. He was so traumatized by that. He says, I'm not voting again. Ron DeSantis in Florida had the cops arrest a number of formerly incarcerated people. And all of those cases were legally voting, and all of those... They were told they could vote, and every single one of those cases were thrown out. Do you believe that this is an effort by Republicans in Texas and Florida and elsewhere to send a chilling effect and to scare any person, but especially any black person, who had previously served time in prison or jail? Absolutely. That's exactly what it was. It was to take a mother with kids to jail for, in the black and the brown community for, the, for again, who, who encouraged you to go vote? Your, your mother, your grandmother, they instilled that in you. So, of course, that's exactly what they did because that would make somebody say, oh, no, I'm not going to go vote and I can possibly go to jail, leave my kids, my family. So that's exactly what they did. And I'm just grateful for the outcome to let people know that don't let my story, took seven long years, but don't let my story discourage you, but encourage you to go to the polls because our votes matter. Mm, mm, mm. Um, finally, um, this, the, this, this criminal aspect is over. Um, how are you going to celebrate? Oh, well, right now I'm just trying to take it in. I'm just trying to take it in. Like, I'm still shocked. I, I couldn't sleep last night. I woke up early this morning calling Kim. And 
I'm just overwhelmed. Like it's, I, I, it, it is, it's hit me, but it hadn't really hit me, you know, like, wow, that I'm, I'm really done. I'm off of an appeal bond that I've been on for six years. I'm off. Wow. And are you completely done with your federal requirements? Yeah, I've been done with that, yes. Well, Kim, uh, Crystal, y'all let us know when you drop that damn lawsuit against Tarrant County, because uh, we absolutely uh, will have you on, because they deserve to be sued, because their actions were, were beyond despicable. And every single prosecutor involved in this, shame on them. Will do, Roland. This was malicious, and we absolutely will let you know. All right. Thank you for following this from beginning to end. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. We're going to go to a break. We'll chat with our panel about this. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support our work. Join our Brenda Funk fan club. Send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, Dallas Sign RM Unfiltered, PayPal R Martin Unfiltered, Venmo's RM Unfiltered Zale. Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. We look at one of the most influential and prominent Black Americans of the 20th century. His work literally changed the world. Among other things, he played a major role in creating the United Nations. He was the first African American and first person of color to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And yet today, he is hardly a household name. We're talking, of course, about Ralph J. Bunch. A new book refers to him as the absolutely indispensable man. His lifelong interest and passion in racial justice, specifically in the form of colonialism. And he saw his work as uh, an activist, an advocate uh, for the black community here in the United States, as just the other side of the coin of his work trying to roll back European empire and Africa. Author Cal Rastiala will join us to share his incredible story. That's on the next Black Table, here on the Black Star Network. Hi, I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. I don't say, I don't play Sammy, but I could. Or I don't play Obama, but I could. I don't do Stallone, but I could do all that. And I am here with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. Folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered. This is my panel, Matt. I'll start with you. If there's anybody, Matt, <clears throat> who should be targeted in re-election is this man right here. This is Phil Sor Sorrells. Uh, he is the district attorney for Tarrant County. He Every black person in Tarrant County uh, should be campaigning against this man because he could have easily said, y'all, enough, enough is enough. The, 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 listen, we mess it up. But bottom line is, she went, she, she went to federal prison for 10 months on a violation. Why in the hell are we trying to pursue five damn years for a ballot that never even got counted? Yeah, they should definitely primary him. And I'm really glad that this case, this uh, story came up today, because just yesterday I got an opinion from my local court of appeals where I lost an appeal that I'm going to take up. But I wanted to tell the viewers that it's extremely difficult to win on appeal, especially in the second um, court of appeals, which is there over Tarrant County. It's one of the most conservative in the whole state. So what happens on appeal most of the time is the judges on appeal are looking to see whether the judge below made a mistake. And what I'm so um, happy that Ms. Cole mentioned is that, you know, they actually lost on appeal at the first level. Now, in Texas, we have two Supreme Courts, essentially. We have one that's all civil, called the Texas Supreme Court, and one that is all criminal called the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. So what's important about this is the highest level criminal court in the state of Texas said that it was, they used the wrong law and the evidence was insufficient. They sent it back 
and the lower court of appeals found the right decision. Um, what's so remarkable about that is it's very, very difficult to win on appeal. Um, what's also remarkable about this is that there was ever a conviction. This is a case every day of the week a prosecutor who has their eyes open should recognize not only could they not prove this case, but they don't have the requisite evidence that she didn't know. And obviously, the testimony corroborated that. And what's scary about this is if they want to make a political statement, they can completely sacrifice um, all decency and just run you through the ringer as they did her. Now, I'm glad to hear that her attorney said the word malicious, because what I thought is the way this lawsuit will likely be brought is a malicious prosecution lawsuit and or a selective enforcement lawsuit under the 14th Amendment, because it's pretty clear that in this very county, you have other people who have engaged in the same alleged conduct who have not received anything punitive at all, let alone punitive to this extent. So uh, hopefully they're successful in that lawsuit. And I'll tell you, those are difficult lawsuits considering all the immunities that prosecutors and judges have. But the larger principle is, you know, one, they climbed the mountain and they won an extremely difficult case that they should never have had to be a part of. But two, it's scary that despite all our systems of checks and balances and purported rule of law following, if they want to get you and they're out to get you, they will do what they can to get you. And that's what happened in this case. And I'm glad she had a formidable team that fought for her and won um, against all odds at the appeal. Um, I mean, this was absolutely malicious prosecution um, uh, in every regard, Kelly. I mean, it just and it and it just made no sense. I mean, literally, the man, the man testifies. We never instructed her that she could not vote. She did not know. They were like, yeah, whatever. No, I and I, I have to remember what exactly was happening exactly eight years ago, right? Not necessarily to the day, but what was happening eight years ago. We were in the middle of yet another election, and and Trump was on the ballot for the first time. And if you recall, and I'm sure you do, there was already um, hints in the air of possibly you know, prosecuting people for, you know, false ballots and trying to vote uh, fraudulently and the like. And it, th this case, to me, makes it abundantly clear that she was used um, incorrectly as an example for the right to uh, feel validated in their response to fraudulent voting um, and, and why Black people need to um, have restrictive access to voting, right? So now that the fire has somewhat sort of died just a little, just enough for this to all to more or less slide under the radar. If it weren't for your show, she would be free, and frankly, nobody would know about it because it's not necessarily being covered. So I, I, that that's my perspective on this. This was a purely political move on behalf of Tarrant County. I agree um, with, I, I believe Matt says something along the lines of this, He uh, the, the DA for Tarrant County needs to be primaried um, because this needs to be in, in the face of every voter, not just black voters, but white voters, Hispanic voters, Asian voters, any voter in that county, because if anything, that DA has made it clear that it's not just black people who are on the line for having their rights taken away. It appears to be that if you are against any of his ideologies at all, if you are against any GOP ideology at all, he will try to prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law, unnecessarily so. He will attack you until he can't attack no more. And that's what we are seeing with this woman here, Crystal Mason. Thankfully, um, that leg of the process is over and she can get her just due in civil court. This, Michael, is a would make me a one-issue voter. I don't give a damn about anything else. Take his ass out at the ballot box. Take this man Phil Sorrell's out at the ballot box. And if he chooses not to run and retires and any of his other people and they were involved in this decision, take their asses out too. Absolutely, Roland. We have to understand why uh, people suppress our vote, especially Republicans. They fear our vote, and Republicans fear our vote oftentimes more than we than we value our vote. And this is why I've said before numerous times on your show, we have to stop telling African Americans to exercise your right to vote. You don't. If you want to exercise, you go to the gym and work out. You vote for power. 
you vote for black power. And historically, um, you've had, in, in these former Confederate states, they've put impediments uh, in the way of the 15th Amendment because they feared African Americans voting these people out of office and having political power. In the 1940s in Texas, they had what were called all white primaries. The Democratic Party was given power by the state legislature to have all white primaries and exclude African Americans from the primaries. This led to the U.S. Supreme Court case in 1944 of Smith versus Allwright that was won by Thurgood Marshall on behalf of Lonnie E. Smith, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that all white primaries were unconstitutional. So so there's a, there's a deep history of this in Texas. And then when you talked about the article from NBCnews.com, uh, Brian Pritchard, uh, first vice chairman of the Georgia Republican Party, a judge ruled that he voted illegally nine times. Now, this is the same guy who spread claims of widespread voter fraud in the stolen election in 2020. And this guy voted illegally nine times. You can't make this stuff up. This is why these people have to be defeated each time at the ballot box, including in 2024. This is about self-preservation. Absolutely. Uh, and again, th this woman, I mean, I mean, just imagine you serve time in federal prison, you get out, you're on supervised release, you're with your family, you're, you're in a home, you got a job, and then this happens, and then they go, oh, no, no. You got to go back to federal prison. Ten months. Added two years. Then when she gets out of federal prison, they still pursue her to throw her in state prison. I mean, I, I, I it is, it is beyond me. And I'm telling, I'm telling you, Matt. I, I mean, every, every, every black person and every person of conscience in Tarrant County should be completely motivated in the next election uh, to say, Phil got to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you completely. I mean, it's, it's, it's abhorrent what they did to her. And what's so sad about it is, frankly, you know, I think they probably thought, look, she's a, a felon from having been in the federal system. And one, she's a black woman, so we know that they were targeting her, right? And that's just what evidence shows here. But I bet they felt like they, you know, had cover because here, in fact, in, in the judge's uh, opinion, they talked about how her prior conviction was something relating to an alleged fraud or something. So they were claiming that her testimony may not have been considered credible. But the reason that all of that is hogwash is because they had uh, evidence from people involved in the process who testified they hadn't told her she couldn't test, she could not vote. And what's so problematic about that is in Texas, we actually have laws that relate to uh, the restoration of, of uh, former felons' rights, but also the possession of guns. And a lot of those laws are written very nebulously. I've literally had clients uh, come to my office before who were getting off of parole or off of supervised release, and they just could not understand whether the law empowered them to do certain things because the law is written poorly. So here, where you have evidence where they've said we did not apprise her that she could not vote, that to me would have killed it as a prosecutor. I would have said, no, well, we don't have any evidence to prove that she had the requisite intent that we need. But if you're trying to target somebody as a political, for a political purpose, then you overlook that. And that's why I'm hoping that their malicious prosecution uh, uh, claim will be successful, because this is as prima facie evidence as that as it comes, I think. Uh, take them out. Take them out. All right, folks, gonna go to break. We'll be right back. Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Don't go anywhere. Back shortly. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million, and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. This is Attorney Demario Solomon Simmons. I'm a national civil rights attorney. I'm also the founder and executive director of Justice for Greenwood. 
Many of you guys know I've been leading the fight with the last two living survivors and the Greenwood community overall. We have a historic hearing coming up on April 2nd at 1.30 p.m. in front of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. I need all of you to support us as we try to get justice for this issue for the first time in almost 103 years. Sign up to support us doing this hearing on Tuesday at justiceforgreenwood.org backslash watch party, April 2nd, 1.30 p.m. We need your support, your messages, and your prayers. We appreciate you. Justice for Greenwood. I'm Farai Tu Muhammad, live from LA, and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. My name is Lena Charles, and I'm from Opelousas, Louisiana. Yes, that is Zodico capital of the world. My name is Margaret Chappelle. I'm from Dallas, Texas, representing the Urban Trivia Game. See, it's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you watch. Roland Martin on Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, welcome back. Uh, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee has appointed eight Tennessee State University alums the Board of Trustees, uh, we discussed that yesterday uh, and even uh, laid out exactly who all of those members are. Here they are again. Now, uh, the folks at Tennessee Holler, uh, they, of course, uh, are a nemesis of the Republicans there in the legislature. Uh, they actually um, shot this video here where the Speaker of the House uh, said, oh, there were some Democrats who were very much uh, supportive of this effort. Listen to this. What did you think about the TSU bill in there? Did you feel like the optics are as bad as some of those Democrats no, because, were saying? No, no, because you have a Democrat caucus that we worked with and that some were supporting it. They wouldn't Who was supporting it? They didn't seem to be supportive of that. You need to go talk to them. There were no Dems that voted for that. Behind the scenes they were. Oh, behind the scenes. Oh, you're trying to start stuff, huh? Which ones? Of course, now attention has to turn to what is next to have conversations with the governor and the administration about board members, the composition of those members. Yeah, we just heard from uh, Speaker, and, and they said that you guys, some Democrat lawmakers, were aware that they were going to bring this in the forward and were on board. Is that true? We had an amendment in government operations that vacated three board members. That was the amendment we thought was going to be on the bill. Now, I was told when session started that there would be a substitute conformity to the Senate bill. And we're, we're never on board with a total vacated Now, House Representative Antonio Perkins uh, yesterday before the House voted questioned why was Tennessee State the only public university in Tennessee that was hit with five audits in one year? And, and Chairman Reagan, I think I know you. And you know me. I know what kind of person you are. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sit here and call anybody in this room a racist or say that this is a racist issue, but I will talk about it being disparate because I don't want my mic cut off. But let's talk about the difference in how this university is treated. Let's talk about the fact that. We had a finding of $544 million that was actually commissioned by our very own speaker. $250 million of those dollars were, were given to, the ten to Tennessee State University the next year. And I wish, today, I wish that we had not given that $250 million to Tennessee State University because that's when the fight began. As soon as the money was given to Tennessee State University, all of the problems became apparent or, or were sought after. $2 million put into the budget for an audit for a university. Disparate never, ever happened in the history of the state of Tennessee. Seven audits. Y'all didn't know that, did you? Seven audits, five of them by the state. 
Those of you from East Tennessee, UT has never dealt with a situation like that. And I'm just talking about the disparate treatment of the one black university in our state. You have to ask yourself this, right? $544 million. Imagine what Tennessee State University looks like with an influx of $544 million. Imagine the people that could be there answering phones, helping students, scholarships, housing. But instead, we choose to hand over $250 million and then tell them how bad of a job they're doing. Well, how can you do a good job if you are short $544 million? Now, I want to speak to these members. I want to speak to these members that I know have an, uh, an independent mindset. I want to speak to the Sam Whitsons. I want to speak to the Mark Whites, the John Gillespie's, the Lowell Russells. Representative Parkinson, Representative Parkinson, I would, I would ask you not to call out names because that gets you in a, in a position. So, Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thought I was speaking positively of them. But to those members who know when right is right and wrong is wrong, who will speak to the disparate treatment of our HBCU, our one land-grant institution that we know has not been treated properly, then we turn, the, we turn the, the, the tables on them and say, you didn't get this corrected in the correct amount of time. Well, let's do, let's do a, a seven audits or five audits from the state, and especially one for $2 million that's looking for criminal activity on UT. Let's see how clean their audits come back. And I'm sorry, UT and President, I, I love you, and I'm, but I'm just trying to make a point, y'all. This is not right. We have the power to let this action be corrected. Let me tell you about power in my 47 seconds. Power gives you the ability to bless someone or the ability to destroy someone. You only get two things with power, the ability to bless someone or the ability to destroy someone. And to you members, I'm gonna ask you this. How are you going to use your power today? Let's go to our panel. Um, the, the thing, we, we discussed this yesterday, Matt, uh, and we've been talking about it all week. First of all, folks, we're going to be in uh, broadcasting live from Nashville on Monday. You can go ahead and show the graphic. Uh, 11 a.m. Uh, local time, 12 Eastern. We're going to be in the state capitol rotunda um, broadcasting uh, a news conference. And then uh, that evening, uh, we're going to be on the campus of Tennessee State University hosting a two-hour town forum broadcasting from there. Guys, you have the graphic? Can we sh All right. So, um, so we're going to be there broadcasting. Uh, our uh, goal, of course, is to highlight these issues uh, and uh, to speak to the issues. Again, uh, everybody's invited, open to the public that evening. We'll be on the campus again of Tennessee State. Uh, and so uh, look forward to that conversation. Uh, Matt, uh, you, you heard the representative there, Representative Parkinson, talk about uh, they had a committee two years ago that showed that Tennessee State had been underfunded by to the tune of $544 million. Then in September, the Biden-Harris administration sent letters out. Um, Education Secretary uh, Cardona and Bill Sack, Ag Secretary, stating that uh, a number of HBCU land-grant institutions uh, in about 16 states, uh, frankly, had been cheated out of $13 billion in land-grant money. In Georgia, the Black Caucus there sued Georgia. Fort Valley State, for instance, they said was owed $603 million. 
Uh, and I said to yesterday, Tennessee Representative Harold Ford, uh, and he said, well, we, you know, we were hoping we'd get this taken care of in the budget. I'm sitting there going, no, you got to sue them. I think there should be massive lawsuits in every single state where you have a public HBCU where they have been cheated out of this money. Story like this about Florida, and I think it was FAMU with a similar um, issue where they've been cheated out of money for decades. And that's what's so horrible about this is that they've underfunded this school for a very long time and are uh, hyper fixated on trying to issue there, despite the fact in one of the, the articles that I read that uh, the University of, Texas, of, of Tennessee, excuse me, at Knoxville, um, apparently had some of the same housing issues and some of the other issues that have been attributed to TSU and its audit. And what I think is interesting about this situation is I was on the Tennessee State website to make sure I learned more about how the Board of Trustees is populated. And it looks like under Tennessee law, the governor gets to appoint eight of those 10 members on the, um, the board. So that's a problem because it seems like the lack of local governance is baked into the law. And it creates a situation where if you have a supermajority or you have a Republican or somebody who is uh, a, an enemy of the school, essentially, they can vacate a board because they serve at the, pr the pleasure of the governor. And I don't know all the procedural requirements for that, but the larger issue is if the schools don't have local uh, autonomy and local authority, then they're always subject to this exact thing happening. And what we know is it's targeting, full stop. I mean, the fact that UT Knoxville has had some of the same issues and has not had an inordinate number of audits in a very short period of time and isn't being called to the carpet um, shows you that they are looking for fault with the black school where they're not looking for fault with other flagship universities. But I think part of the issue is going forward, there needs to be um, a recalibration of how the schools can even govern themselves. And I know there are probably similar um, mechanisms in other states and similar board of trustee type situations, but the problem is Tennessee State needs to be able to govern itself. And the problem is with Bill Lee now being able to put in all 10 people um, on this board, or rather all eight of them, I think, that um, are appointed by him, and then there's one other uh, member that's populated, I think, by the school, a faculty member, that allows him to control, and Republicans, frankly, to control Tennessee State's future going forward. So there are multiple issues at play here, and I think it's called the FOCUS Act. And if I were a Democrat in Tennessee, I would be working nonstop to repeal that so that the, the local schools have local autonomy. The thing here that I am trying, and I, we've been sounding this along, Kelly, and every HBCU where Republicans have a supermajority, they had better prepare themselves because Republicans are going to repeat this kind of crap here all across the, uh, the country, and especially all across the South. Absolutely. And I would go a step further and say, even if you have an HBCU that is not in a GOP stronghold, I would still urge those HBCUs to fight to make sure and ensure that they have um, self-governing capabilities, because politics are politics. There's no guarantee that your governor will always be uh, an HBCU advocate. So you need to prepare yourself to to make sure that anything that comes your way, you you have solid footing and and it, you won't be swayed one way or the other. But what I will say regarding Tennessee specifically, it is astounding to me how the the half a billion dollars um, that they have not uh, yet received. That's how underfunded they have been, and yet they have some of the most incredible alumni in the world. They have some of the best students on the planet right now. The education that people get at TSU and every HBCU um, is, is bar none. And the fact that we have a history of being underfunded, the fact that we have a history of being disenfranchised and overlooked and under uh, uh, underfunded uh, um, across the board, and yet you still have this legacy of excellence. Can you imagine if we actually were funded, if we actually did get our worth? Um, and it wouldn't just be a benefit to just Black students. It would literally be a benefit to the entire country because it would be a reflection of the entire higher education system in this country and how excellent it can all be. But racism rears its ugly head every time 
and 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 we get stuff like this and it it to me it's just sad the fact that racism disenfranchises everyone but they only think of themselves and that's how um things like this just keep going and perpetuate uh michael um i'm telling you uh people need to understand when you start looking at crt woke right. DEI, affirmative action decision. Everybody kept talking about after the affirmative action decision, oh, this is a silver lining for HBCUs. No, it's not. They are going to be attacked. And these Republicans are not going to want these places uh, to be bastions of black power. Correct, Roland. All this is a, a, a continuation of the U.S. Civil War in the, in the in the Reconstruction. If you if you understand what these white supremacists were doing from 1865 to 1877, then going into the Jim Crow era where they're rewriting state constitutions to impose poll taxes and literacy tests to attack African Americans. This is a continuation of this, and it's and and it's a continuation of them using uh, the laws and the power of the state legislature as well as the governorship to attack African. Americans. I've said numerous times on this show, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and in the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties. And this is what we're seeing here. Everything that governs our lives turns on the vote. Uh, and, and reading the uh, article from NBC News on this, as well as one from uh, News Channel 5 uh, Nashville, they talk about how over a 30-year period of time, uh, Tennessee State University has been underfunded uh, by the tune of $2.1 Billion dollars, okay, yeah, uh, and that's so, uh, underfunded so, from so, from the state. Right? No, 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 no. The five hundred and forty-four million is from the state. The two point yeah. one billion—that's what they're owed from the federal uh, because of those land grant dollars from the federal government. Land, yeah, land grant is, a, is a, a land grant colleges. Yeah, land grant. No, uh, and that's what I'm saying. So yesterday, when Harold Love was mm -hmm. on, he said that you had Republicans. They were they were trying to mix the two together. It's supposed to be no. Mm -hmm. Those are two separate pools of money. A, a, a Tennessee committee in 2022 determined that Tennessee State was owed five, but they were under underfunded to the tune of $544 million by the state at $2.1 billion. That's what they actually are owed uh, as a result of those federal dollars. Okay, so we're talking about close to $2.6 billion. $2.6 so. billion. Yep, two point six billion exactly. Okay, so all of this is is a fight over money and power, scarce wealth, power and resources, and and this also deals with the power of a governor. Okay, because the governor has the authority to appoint the board uh, to uh, this HBCU, Tennessee State University. And as, as you, first of all, you did a fantastic segment, Roland. I watched the entire thing. It was about 46 minutes. And Dr. Greg Carr yesterday was, was fantastic as well in his analysis on this. And he said that these white supremacists are running a Boston on us. And this is going to be the model that they use from state to state to yep. state. So this is why we have to fight back. This is about self-preservation. Uh, I keep letting folks know that this thing is real. Uh, so folks need to understand it's happening now. While that happened, the governor also signed a bill repealing police traffic stop reforms made in Memphis after the fatal uh, beating of Tyree Nichols by Memphis cops in January 2023. GOP lawmakers pushed this bill despite pleas from Nichols' parents to give them a chance to find a compromise. Lee's signature means that the law, uh, out, the law uh, outlaws so-called uh, pretextual traffic stops, such as for a broken taillight and other mi minor violations, that that law is immediately rendered null and void. Lee agreed with Republican lawmakers who said Nichols' death needed to result uh, in accountability for officers who abuse power, but not new limits on how authorities conduct traffic stops. And this is what we talk about and the fact that they did... I mean, what th this is all because, Matt, they have a supermajority and they can do whatever they want and it doesn't matter what Democrats have to say. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And it goes back to the, the same point I made earlier about local control and divesting Memphis, a, a democratic stronghold of its autonomy. But what I think is especially insidious about this particular bill is the messaging that they're trying to advance. And what they're saying is, yeah, 
the officers who engaged in this need to be held accountable, but we don't need to take away officers' ability to do what they think is right on the street. And they're trying to sell that as though it gives officers more freedom to make, you know, the stops that they think are appropriate in enforcing the law. But what it's really saying is we think the people in Memphis, one, can't do something that is, uh, you know, a justice a justice reform measure where you're going to stop officers from being able to use pretext stops, which is one of the biggest issues in policing, pretext stops, where they pull you over for some minor infraction to try to search your car or do some other thing, and a major arrest ends up coming out of it, right? That happens all the time, where they use a pretext to stop you. So not stopping uh, the police officers in Memphis from doing this sends a message to say, one, we don't think you can govern yourselves, and two, we're going to give police officers carte blanche to do whatever they want, even if it is shown that those pretext stops don't correlate with a large number of felony stops and are racially divisive and racially discriminatory, which we know that they are both in Tennessee and across the country. So I think the messaging especially is problematic here because the people of Memphis elect their representatives, and those representatives have the autonomy to decide what is best for their community. And that is normally what we hear conservatives trumpet in all of the state houses where conservatives have a supermajority, including here in Texas. So it's interesting that they turn back on their own word and ideology when it's advantageous for them to do so, despite crowing this all the rest of the time. The crazy thing for me, Kelly, is you got people who don't even live in Memphis who are not from Memphis, who are now telling Memphis what they can do. And I guarantee you those same Republicans will be mad as hell if Memphis are telling them what to do in their city, in their county. Well, sure. But if if anything um, that the GOP is good for, um, it's hypocrisy. So what's good for the goose isn't always necessarily good for the gander as far as they're concerned. If it's good for them, it's good. If it's good for somebody else, it's bad, and they don't want that to happen. So I, I echo Matt's sentiments, um, but really this boils down to uh, a power grab, a disenfranchisement yet again of people of color in that jurisdiction and, and trying to uh, maintain what little power they still have and have an attempt to grow that power so that they don't uh, come back into this situation. But hopefully with voting, with with uh, vigilance, um, you know, some things can turn back around. Um, we, we say it all the time, Michael, why voting matters. You've got Republicans in Louisiana, uh, that MAGA Jeff Landry, the, now the governor. Now mm. they want to rewrite the state's constitution in two weeks. People better, under- people, people better understand what happened when you stay your ass at home. So all y'all people sitting there ta- talking about, uh, oh, I'm going to go ahead and stay at home. Uh, in November, okay. You're a damn fool. You're a damn fool and don't understand history. Go go back to 1898 when Louisiana rewrote their state constitution. They imposed poll taxes, literacy tests, a grandfather clause, but they also imposed a 9-3, uh, uh, a, a 9-3 clause uh, for criminal court cases so that if you were found uh, guilty in a a, a criminal court case, it didn't have to be unanimous. It could be 9-3. And they did this specifically. When you go research this, they did this specifically to nullify any African-Americans that were on a jury, because it was legal for African-Americans to serve on juries in Louisiana in 1898. So they did that so that if African-Americans on the jury found that an uh, African-American defendant was not guilty, nine white people found them guilty, guess what, you're guilty and you go to prison. That, it, it, then uh, decades later, it was switched to 10 to 2. It was made unanimous somewhere around 2018, okay? So this is this is a legacy of that Jim Crow era. People don't, your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history. When I hear people talking about not voting, staying at home, they are trying to wipe us off of the political chessboard. They're doing it at the state legislature level. They're doing it at the local level. They're trying to take back the, the White House, keep the House of Representatives, and take back the Senate. And then if you study what the Heritage Foundation is trying to do with Project 2025, OK, they're trying to repeat the same game that they ran in 1980 with the first uh, Reagan administration. The Heritage Foundation, this right-wing think tank, 
they put out a book that contained 2,000 policies that they wanted enacted by the Reagan administration. The Reagan administration enacted 60 percent of those policies, downsizing government, you know, uh, reversing policies that were beneficial for African Americans. They're trying to do the same thing again because it worked and we still haven't figured this out. This is why voting is so important. But you have to understand history, economics, law and politics and how all this comes together. Uh, hold tight for one second. When we come back, we're going to talk about folks now targeting a scholarship named after George Floyd. Y'all, I'm telling you, anything out there for black folks, they coming after it. You're watching Roland Martin on the Filter on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. As president, I put money in pockets and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. I'm Dee Barnes, and next on The Frequency, Beyonce has always been country. We're talking to music, pop culture, and politics writer Taylor Crompton about her new article on Beyonce's new country songs and how country music has always been part of Black culture. Since the release of Texas Hold'em in 16 Carriages, there has been a definition of what Black country music is and a definition of what white country music is. Mm -hmm. White country music historically has always won the awards, we've always got the certifications. Black country music has not. This is a conversation you don't want to miss. That's next on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Paula J. Parker. Judy Proud on The Proud Family. Louder and Prouder on Disney+. Plus. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Well, why conservatives strike again? This time they're going after Minnesota's North Central University's George Floyd Memorial Scholarship for Young Black Students, a legal complaint filed by the Equal Protection Project with the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights says that the scholarship violates Title VI of the Civil Rights Act by exclusively qualifying for black students. The law prohibits um, intentional discrimination uh, based on race, color, or national origin in any federally funded program or activity. Here's the scholarship's description. Thank you for your interest in the George Floyd Memorial Scholarship. The George Floyd Memorial Scholarship provides a way to invest in a new generation of young black Americans, poised and ready to be leaders in our community and our nation. We believe that the George Floyd Memorial Scholarship will enable North Central University to increase our number of black students who will impact the learning environment in a positive manner. Diversifying our learning environment is key to being a university that looks and acts like heaven. Well, guess what? Uh, these, are the, these are the requirements here. Uh, but let's just be real clear. Uh, these, these, uh, these, these folk here, they ain't Christian. Uh, they don't care. And bottom line here is, Michael, and I keep warning people, I keep warning them, if any, if a hey, if it's if it's if anything if it's any program to help black people, oh, these white races coming after all of them. Yes, they are rolling, and uh, this is a continuation of the conversation that we had with the sisters who uh, founded the Fearless Fund and the lawsuit that uh, white conservative Ed Bloom filed. Now, uh, I'm not, I know they're citing Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. I guess they're citing Section 601, non-discrimination in federally assisted programs, which makes race-based programs illegal. Um, if people go to archives.gov and read the 1964 Civil Rights Act and look at Title VI, Section 601, it explains it there. Now, what the, the distinction that I need made are these federal funds rolling or are these like funds from another source? Because the, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Section 601, deals with federally funded, federally 
assisted program. Well, they're, cla they're, they're claiming any, because this university receives federal funds, there can't okay. be a scholarship that targets African Americans. Matt? So, you know, Michael kind of got right where I was going to go. I think it's a matter now of changing the strategy. And I think that schools who want to provide a scholarship like this need to have a link on their website that shows all the available scholarships. But the money has to come from a completely private entity, private endowment or mm -hmm. private foundation. Mm -hmm. Because what's problematic about this, I, I read the Title VI complaint and I have a case adjacent to a, a Title VI complaint right now. And it's exactly, from my understanding, what you said. It is an organization or um, an entity that receives federal funding. If they are discriminating in the benefits of their programming, then they're in violation of the law. And what makes this very tenuous legally is uh, the, the case from last year, Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard, they've actually cited that case in their Title VI letter to the Department of Education Civil Rights Office. And what it says in that, that case is it says that even if the motive is essentially a positive one, i.e. to empower people of a particular protected class here, black Americans, it runs afoul of the law. And the problem is, I don't think they're wrong, at least as it relates to the letter of the law. So now it's incumbent on us, um, people who are trying to support black students particularly, to find ways around that. And frankly, that has to be completely private money that's doling out these scholarships that is not um, in any way, you know, um, adherent to the federal funding or receiving federal funding. And that's what I see as the problem here, because they're trying to use it as both, you know, a sword and a shield, essentially, in saying, well, if you are saying that we're uh, discriminating by not allowing enough black students in or, you know, uh, as it relates to admissions programs, then anything that is just for black people is something that runs afoul of the law. And the way the law is written, I think it, there is a little bit of a hole there. So, I don't know how, how to do that beyond strategizing and putting the money in a pot that has no federal funding whatsoever. Kelly? No, I uh, echo the sentiments of Matt here. Um, I immediately thought of the scholarships that I have received in the course of my academic work. Um, and because I went to an HBCU or was um, from an HBCU going into other academia, there were scholarships in place, again, um, com almost completely privately funded um, that were targeting um, people of color um, in very unique ways. So it wasn't that white people couldn't get them, but you had to be where black people are in order to get them, that being an HBCU. So if you have, like, again, Matt's, like Matt said, you have to be strategic in this regard um, in order to get what you need. Um, and there will always be a way to get black people what they need. So I'm not necessarily worried about that, but I will say that it is frustrating for um, what I find to be a somewhat dying breed of Americans being the, this staunchly racist, this gung-ho and adamant about not helping people of color, still controlling um, what is necessary for people of color to survive and thrive in this country. Hopefully, like I said, this dying breed will die off sooner rather than later. Um, but in the meantime, strategies will um, come into play to make sure that we have what we need. Uh, indeed, indeed. Michael, Kelly, uh, Matt, I appreciate y'all being on today's show. Thank you so very much. Folks, when we come back, we'll continue our tribute uh, to the late, great Lou Gossett Jr., who passed away last night at the age of 87. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. This is attorney Demario Solomon Simmons. I'm a national civil rights attorney. I'm also the founder and executive director of Justice for Greenwood. Many of you guys know I've been leading the fight with the last two living survivors and the Greenwood community overall. We have a historic hearing coming up on April 2nd at 1.30 p.m. in front of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. I need all of you to support us as we try to get justice for this issue for the first time in almost 103 years. Sign up to support us during this hearing on Tuesday justiceforgreenwood.org backslash watch party, April 2nd, 1.30 p.m. We need your support, your messages, and your prayers. We appreciate you. Justice for Greenwood.
on the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie. People can't live with them, can't live without them. Our relationships often have more ups and downs than a boardwalk roller coaster, but it doesn't have to be that way. Trust your gut. Whenever your gut is like, this isn't healthy, this isn't right, I don't like the way that I'm being treated. This goes for males and females. Trust your gut and then whenever that gut feeling comes, have a conversation. Knowing how to grow or when to go, a step-by-step guide on the next A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. Janet actually called me and she said, do you remember us having an argument in the studio or whatever, whatever? And I said, no, not really, because we never argued in the studio. Uh -huh. And she said, well, there's this piece we found and can I, can you come over and watch it with me? And I said, sure. And I went over and watched it and I loved it. I just started laughing. I said, this is great. This is great, Janet. And she said, okay, so you're okay with this? I said, yeah, I'm fine with it. Because literally we worked together for, I mean, I don't know how many days we've been in the studio together. And literally we had maybe one, argument like that right and it was captured but of course that's the thing that you know absolutely people want to see but yeah that kind of thing happens some days that's with you know your voice isn't good today let's just go see a movie or let's go just chill or but you know some days it's tough love like you got to do that again I'm Joe Marie Payton, voice of Sugar Mama on Disney's Louder and Prouder Disney Plus, and I'm with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. laughing at me, dick brain. No, sir! You better stop eyeballing me, boy. I'll rip your eyeballs out the sockets and skull fuck you to death. Yes, sir! What's your name, boy? Mayo. Zach Mayo, sir. How did you slip into this program? I didn't know the Navy was so hard up. The winner is Lou Lewis Gossett, Gossett Jr. You know, when you prepare a speech, it's no use, because it's all gone. <laughs> I tried to get my kid to come up here to share this with me. But there are some special people I would like to share this with. Specifically, tomorrow is the 17th anniversary of my relationship with my one agent, Mr. Ed Bondi. <laughs> they say marriages don't last. I've got a spirit that guides me, starting with my great-grandmother who died at the age of 117, mm. and uh, my mom and dad, who I know are watching, and my cousin Yvonne, thank you. You make everything fall into place. And all you other four guys, this is ours. Mm. Thank you. Lou Gossett, uh, of course, uh, uh, winning, and in fact, if I'm correct, he was the first African-American to win an Oscar since Sidney Poitier uh, did. That's why it was uh, so historic. Four years ago, uh, we were on the red carpet uh, at the American Black Film Festival uh, and talking to a variety of folks, and uh, Lou Gossett came by, and so uh, we um, had an opportunity to uh, chat with him 
Uh, and so we're going to show you uh, some of that conversation. And what's interesting, uh, in that same red carpet, uh, we also I talked for the first time and only time with Lance Reddick, who passed away last year as well. Here is our chat with Lou. Was a little difficult. All right. GMC oh. Sierra. Hold up, let's see it come. All right, so we're gonna get this set up right here. Uh, so, um, video, here we go. I think we got it going. I think we got it. All right, here we go. Because, All right, go ahead. Uh, of, uh, because of, uh, you know, loss of John Singleton. And so, it's always good to see. Uh, about to see him right, talk, talk to him now. It's always good to see my man. How you doing? You looking good. What's that food you eating? Give me some. Huh? <laughs> well, of course, I got, I'm going to kneel down here. I got this when I was, I just got this uh, when I was in Ghana in December. Uh, so I, I, I got this outfit here. Well, I was in Ghana in November. Did you get my message? I didn't get your message. <laughs> but you do, you, you, when you do call me, when you call me, it's like, I you should call me. It's important. Click. I'm going I'm to talk to you. I got some stuff to talk to you about. No problem. Hit me anytime. I have a foundation. It's called E-Racism. And now's the time for it to be in action. Uh, after we travel around, we see what the situation and the problems are. I think it'll make sense to you. What this is in a chair is the accumulation of all the football, all its, the fights, all the falling off horses, all the punches over a 60-year career. Absolutely. Of course, you, uh, it's my choice to be like this way. You've been honored tonight, uh, and it's great to see so many people who want to come out and uh, show you some love tonight. I'm amazed. I'm pleasantly amazed, especially these young folks. That's amazing. It's a miracle. But they've been watching you. We've been watching. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Great pleasure. And you look good, sir. Well, you know, I'm just I'm just trying to do do like you. You know, I, I see I see you, you got the you got the relaxed black tux tonight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's just I'm uncomfortable. I understand. That's why I'm real comfortable. And I tell them all the time, see if you wear an African outfit at a black event, they can't turn you away. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> see? Right. They can be uncomfortable in tuxedo. We'll be real comfortable. Very comfortable. Very comfortable. All right, Doc. I'll well, see you later. Always on. good to see you. You give me a, give me a call. We'll chat any time. Absolutely. All right. You take care. All right, folks. Uh, Lewis Gossett there. And so uh, appreciate it. So we're, all, we're always. Uh, we're well, always. in 2016, when the remake of Roots uh, was released, uh, we chatted with Lou Gossett Jr. on TV One's News One Now. Uh, you know, very, very touching. Right here, let me quickly get a photo of this. It's done, and then it would be up in the thing, and then we get on with normal. We had no idea that this was going to be a god shot, and we had no idea there was going to be lightning in the bottle. But we were getting this, this acceptance now because the things, the society was growing up, if you know what I'm saying. We needed to step on the, the, the southern market, put it on from Monday to Friday, and get rid of it. But we could get, had our say, and then we'd go back to normal. We did the very best we can because we never knew we'd get another job opportunity to do it again. So all of a sudden, you guys begin to win these awards, Emmys, Golden Globe, Peabody. Um, what was the reaction from the cast with the love you were receiving from across the country? Totally surprised. That, that, but then you back up and you say, it's like Alice Haley's uh, grandma said, God may not be there when you want him, but he's always there on, on time. So it was, uh, the roots was a time whose, a thing whose time had come. Everything was right. We had no idea that it was going to be so enormously successful, nor did ABC. When it hit, the entire world stopped, including the southern market. And it was the, still the highest uh, uh, watched television series in the television history, because the time had come. So then uh, we started to say, well, maybe this is not just a little special thing. It took a minute for us to realize how important it was as we got our awards and we got our different uh, invitations to different venues. It took over a year for them to, to not expect it, to put programming. And that's where John Amos came with the Jeffersons and Good Times, et cetera. And then things have gotten better incrementally every year since then. How important was the success of the original route to launching the careers of so many African Americans in Hollywood? It opened a lot of doors, but it took a minute for those projects to be prepared over a year, year and a half, and then they started spilling out. I wound up doing Sadat, managed to do Lawman Without a Gun, a Benny's Place, uh, Satchel Page, 
Uh, thank God for television because all those stories needed to be told, but only after Roots was done. So here we are now focused on the 40th anniversary of Roots. Uh, what do you see as the long-term impact of this miniseries on television and Hollywood? Well, it's had an incredible impact because it's still the most watched television series in television history, including the moonshot. More people watched this than watched the moonshot. So Roots is such a historical blockbuster that we're going to do it again. And Mark Roper thought to do it again because his children didn't understand the original Roots. So he's translating using contemporary famous people to play the same parts, more power to them. But the door is wide open for the rest of our story. The rest of our legacy has to come. And there's an audience waiting to see it. In films, 12 Years a Slave, The Help, etc., there's so much more to tell. And now our filmmakers have the opportunity, because there's so many venues, to tell those stories straight from us to the public. Thank God for Roots First. And we've gone incrementally in that direction ever since. But faster now than before. Now, of course, Roots is now being remade. It's going to air on the History Channel uh, beginning of Memorial Day. Now, when I talked to you at the Trumpet Awards, you said this. It's been done. Why We can't reinvent the wheel. The story's been told. There's so much else. There's a continuum. There's the Harlem Renaissance. There's the cowboy. There's the soldiers. The literary people. W.E.B. Du Bois. There's so much to tell in continuation. So that's a legacy. We should need to continue on if we have that air, that air time. I know why, because he wants to be like his dad. But I'd like to encourage him to continue on with the legacy. There's so much to tell. It's never going to be over. It's like Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. We have a lot of stories about us that people need to know about. So the question I have, why have you changed your mind? Well, my, my take was uh, that uh, my, uh, my initial gut take, and they punished me because I'm not part of the new rules, but it's OK. That, uh, David Wolper did a beautiful job, and so did we. That's been done. Just re-show it to the next ch children and explain to them what it's about. Mark Wolper made a decision. I have to respect his decision to show his children a route that they would understand. Okay, that being done, we still have the rest of our legacy to tell. So if he hasn't done it, we're going to have to. We're going to have to do that. So I can't put that down as much as I used to before, because my gut thing is, why reinvent the wheel? Your father did a brilliant job, and so did us. Why do it again? Obviously, it's his decision. So we will see it, compare the tape. The, the great you know, Forrest Whitaker's playing Fiddler. I got to see him do that. There's Lawrence Fishburne. I got to see all those people do that again. And then now we've got two. Now we still got to get on with the rest of the story. So when it comes to Roots, you have, of course, uh, Will Packer as producer, Mario Van Peebles as one of the directors. How important is it to have African-Americans who are in front of the camera and behind the camera telling these stories? Well, it changes the consciousness. So we just talked about this in another interview, wondering when we're going to get another shot and when we're going to get another, when are they going to give us an opportunity? We don't have to wait for them giving us opportunity anymore. There's so many venues and, and there's some money coming that we finally can tell our own story our own way. And then to level the playing field. And that's what Selma is, and that's what other things are done. So Ava and Will Packer and others. We're gonna, and Denzel now on HBO and, 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 uh, and, and, and um, Fuqua, Antoine Fuqua. What a combination of people. We don't have to wait for another opportunity. We can create the opportunity now. It's the beginning of that new mentality. It's very exciting to know how much more is going to happen. I'm directing my next movie with Nick Cannon and Lisa Leslie. And we've had you on TV One before talking to next generation of young actors. What do you say to the likes of Michael B. Jordan, Chadwick Boseman, and all these other young brothers and sisters who are coming up in Hollywood? Well, my answer is go for it. Go for it. There's no such thing as impossible these days. There's so much. All we have to do is prepare properly, and the opportunity will come. No such thing as impossible. You shoot for a 10, you get a 5. That's five more than you had when you started. Go for another 10. Go in that direction, and don't give up. All right, Lou Gossett, always good to see you, brother. Take care. Thank you, Roland. Still got my love and respect. God bless. Folks, Roots, the complete original series, is now available in digital HD for downloads from digital retailers and will be released on Blu-ray on June 7th. Folks, um... When we talked to Lou Gossett in December 2022, uh, he showed us a video. He was in a car, uh, and the cast of The Color Purple uh, paid tribute to him. And uh, uh, Lou told his 
folks to send it to us, and I thought he had airdropped it to us. I'm going to keep looking for it. Uh, but um, it is on... Um, it was on YouTube and was shot from another angle. And, and Fantasia posted this in her tribute to Lou Gossett today on Instagram. We wanted to tell you, um, we, have, we just wanted to say thank you so much. We thank you, dear legend. You may not think of yourself this way, but we know you are. We are on your shoulder. We thank you. We appreciate you so much. And all that you gave to us today, we thank you so much. We thank you for everything that you've done. All of the world and races you've done. We thank you. From the bottom of our hearts, we want to say thank you. Thank you. Man, Lou, Lou was so moved uh, by that, uh, and he was just, um, he just thought it was amazing uh, how they paid their respects uh, to him uh, for that. Uh, and so we certainly um, appreciate him and his work. And, and normally when folks, when we do these memoriams, we normally invite a number of artists and others to, to reflect on them. Uh, but because we had so many interviews and interactions with Lou Gossett Jr., we want to actually spend the time and show you those. So we're going to go to a break and we come back. Uh, we're going to have for you that one on one interview uh, that I did with Lou Gossett, uh, rolling, roll, roll, rolling with Roland interview. Uh, I'm so glad uh, he would call me and he would hit me up and he would say, man, we got to sit down and talk. And I was so glad that we finally, finally made that happen. Uh, in December 2022, uh, and so we'll do that. And so that is it uh, for me. Uh, I will see you guys on Monday live from uh, Nashville uh, in our continuation of the tribute to the great Lou Gossett Jr., who passed away at the age of 87. He is now an ancestor. I'll see you on Monday. This is attorney Demario Solomon Simmons. I'm a national civil rights attorney. I'm also the founder and executive director of Justice for Greenwood. Many of you guys know I've been leading the fight with the last two living survivors and the Greenwood community overall. We have a historic hearing coming up on April 2nd at 1.30 p.m. in front of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. I need all of you to support us as we try to get justice for this issue for the first time in almost 103 years. Sign up to support us during this hearing on Tuesday at justiceforgreenwood.org backslash watch party, April 2nd, 1.30 p.m. We need your support, your messages, and your prayers. We appreciate you. Justice for Greenwood. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. He stoked racial violence, attacked voting rights, and if reelected, vowed to be a dictator and, quote, get revenge. We can't go back. As president, I put money in pockets, creating millions of new jobs, and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. I'm Joe Biden. And I approve this message. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits.
Look, we've been trying to do this for years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Finally. Finally, finally, finally. finally. It's good to see you, sir. Doc, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm very lucky, man. I'm here on, on God's time, you know. I've been, you can look at the, the length of my career. Started at the age of 17 in 1953. Now, have a photograph of me and my great-grandmama, who's from down here. Mm -hmm. She had to be approximately, and that photograph, 110. Wow. So it's, uh, she was a slave, so we don't know, I say approximately, because the Bible didn't get started until after the slaves were freed, and her birth was not recorded in the Bible, and she remembers the Bible being started. So when, then the next time I'll show you these photographs. So now I've been doing this since 1953, and this is what year it is now. I'm on Barra's time. I'm on just the longest career that you can think of. Now see, it's interesting listening to you. So I just saw Emancipation. Yes, sir. Yes. Starring Will Smith. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing when we have these conversations with people and they say, oh, um, slavery was just so long ago. And so for you to say, no, my great-grandmother was a slave. Yes. It's, and I think it's now to our benefit. Because when you travel, like Glenn is starting to travel now and others will, we get to see the, the condition of other countries, other oceans, other cultures. And if we believe in God, and a lot of us do, he's telling us if you don't get rid of that stuff that makes somebody superior or inferior and work together for their mutual salvation, everybody's gone. So I walk around talking to the kids with my foundation, which is that one. Mm -hmm. But uh, as an elder, let's call for what it's worth. I don't get into anybody's face. But the truth is the truth. We are desperately needed at our best for the salvation of mankind. I want to talk about that. Just Obviously, we really want to go in detail about roots. What but it, 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 I did a video the other, after I saw Emancipation. And it absolutely bothers me when I hear people say, look, man, I'm sick of these slavery movies. We're more than that. I, I, that that's, that's pain, that's, that's, that's black trauma. And, and my deal is uh, Jewish folks make it perfectly clear. Oh, of course. Never forget. No, never forget. And, 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 and I say, mm -hmm. I don't care what you say, when I see many of these films, I'm seeing resilience, I'm seeing uh, a fight. I'm saying never broken. It's and no so, such thing as impossible. And so for me, it's not, it's not trauma. It's called history. Yes, it is, yeah. Now, there's a, there's a trick in it, though. And the trick is if you hold on to that resentment, we're the ones that get the cancer. We're the ones that get the high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So we need to take it and put it aside as we go ahead for the benefit of us all. We just have one of the oldest cultures that's desperately needed for mutual salvation. Mm -hmm. That's the consciousness for us to behave as if we have the keys in our roots to save mankind right. and be a major con contribution to our mutual salvation. That puts us where we belong. I gave a uh, commencement speech to Grambling. Yes, sir. And the title of the speech was, Never Say Toby. <laughs> Tony, yeah. And, and so when I, when, I, when I gave the commencement speech, and I, when I worked in newspapers, oh, yeah. one of the black staffers, <clears throat> I would say that. I think they would be frustrated, they would be upset. And I would just, I would say, never say Toby. Never say and Tony. I, never say Toby. Toby, yeah. And, and the white staffers never knew what the hell I was talking about. Yes, sir. And the black folks were like, bro, did you say never say Toby? I'm like, yes, never say Toby. And they, and, and, and they were shocked that I would say that, but I was trying to get them to understand, don't let them break you. Yeah, but it, 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 we're getting to the place where the way we think and feel now is for the benefit of everybody's benefit. There's no enemy. We're together. Uh, otherwise, we're on this 747 airplane, you know, and it's at 30,000 feet and it's about to crash. The people inside the plane are fighting over who's going to be in first class. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Uh -huh. Now it's time to, sometimes reluctantly, to take the, to bury, the, bury the hatchet a little bit and work together for a mutual salvation. And that one act puts us where we belong. You mentioned consciousness. Yes, sir. And I've said for years, black America needs a massive reprogramming. Oh, yeah. yeah. That a deprogramming. Mm -hmm. Deprogramming and then reprogramming, reminding uh, before Fiddler. 
uh, what we came with. We, we were told to get rid of that stuff. Now that very same thing that we're told to get rid of is one of the things that's most necessary for our mutual salvation. Mm -hmm. the, the, the love of God, the, the pride and the, the earth, the water, and one another, men and women, women and men, children. There's this child that the other day is in the papers, 12 years old. Can't speak his voice, don't go any higher than that. He kills a 13-year-old. And God got proud of it. Walking down the street, I, I got him. That's not us. That's not us. It, it breaks my heart. That's not the boy I remember in front of the, the Maasai line in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Or the kid uh, who's from the uh, Ashanti. That's not them. That's not our children. You, no. you've, never, you've never been shy or afraid of Afrocentric roots. And, and, and it's amazing, a lot of our people, man, I'm not from there. Uh, and so if you're wearing the clothes and people, <laughs> man, what are you doing? You're just like, it, it's a costume. Uh, or you, you it, it, it's always interesting when I'm having these conversations with, with some individuals. Mm -hmm. And I explain to them all the time, one, if that's your view, you clearly have never used your passport. And two, you've never ha actually had that experience of stepping foot in the motherland and, and seeing and feeling and understanding mm -hmm. where we actually come from yeah. and where civilization comes from. Well, I believe very much in God. I had a full circle, I tried everything. You know, me and Billy Dee Williams, all we, we did all that stuff. You know, up in Harlem and we danced and all that. Friend comes down full circle. God's still in charge. He's over in the corner with his arms folded with a laugh and a smile on his face. Well, if he's in charge, we're going to come back to the truth eventually. And uh, there's roles that we played back in Africa before we got slavery. And there's a reason why we. Uh, control the, the planet. We made a lot of mistakes, but we control the planet with that system of whatever age, there's something for you to do with the benefit of the whole tribe. Make the bed, gather the beans, we'll get the, 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 the eggs, and the women would cook. It, it would go that way until you become uh, a, a father and then an elder, which is I've become a griot. As long as that's the first order of business is to feed back whatever it takes back to the tribe so everybody listens. If somebody falls out of line, they stick out like a sore thumb. Now they're all sticking out like a sore mm -hmm. thumb. So you can see the difference of what we used to do as opposed to what's happening today. It, it, it breaks my heart to see a, a kid whose voice has not even dropped yet. I shot that. That makes, doesn't make sense. That's not us. That's not us. So for what it's worth, until God calls me, I'm so fortunate to be left alive and it's as reasonably healthy to open my mouth like here and everywhere else and say, it's more for us to do. We go back to the basics. And the ones who are listening are shining and sticking out like wonderful sort of thumbs. The athletes, the, the actors now, I'm so proud to still be around to witness. Even Will Smith, that is one of the finest actors and gentlemen I know. He deserves to get what he's getting. That was an emotional thing. That's something else. Mm -hmm. But there's so many of them out there. It's, bridge, it's, it's great to be sitting here and listen and watch these kids. Taraji Henson. Boy, there's some good ones out there. They're so good, man. I'm glad that they're getting an opportunity to, to grace a, a sta soundstage with them. Where'd they come from? I'm looking young. It's just, it's, I want to put my tobacco back. I'm going, good, yeah, look at you. <laughs> I saw those, some, some young brothers and sisters out here. I'm very proud of them. When you, it's interesting uh, you say that because there were anybody who, who understands the history when Roots was being made. Yes, sir. Any, every black person in Hollywood was trying to be in that. Yeah. And so many people just believed after the fact because of the ratings and all the attention that it would just throw open so many doors for black actors, and it didn't happen. It was the season of Roots. It was put on because it had to uh, contract with David uh, Walper and, uh, and Fred, Fred Silverman. As realistic, he would lose ratings 
for seven days. And then we'd be finished and go back to normal. And the whole thing flipped around. My best friend in Roots was Vic Morrow. We grew up together. We mm. played ball together. He was a great athlete. And he came, I came on the set as Fiddler. And I had just met uh, LeVar. We hung out and, and we fell in love. That was my father and son, big brother. And Vic said, hey, Louie, New York guy. I said, I want to apologize in advance. I said, why? He said, well, you'll see. So I'm standing there as Fiddler. I'm looking at LeVar Burton and Kunta Kinte at the same time. I'm looking at my friend, Vic Morrow, asking Kunta Kinte to say, Toby. And I got mixed emotions. Because he, he apologized, he knew what was going to happen. Right. So finally, when LeVar finally said, Kunta Kinte said, my name is Toby, it broke my heart. So now he's cut down, and that's the end of the scene. But I kept on going, and they kept the camera going. So I said uh, to him, I said, well, I wiped his hands. I said, what do you, what do you care what uh, that man wants you to say? Kunta Kinte, that's your name. That's who you always be. And I looked up at Vic, and I said, there's going to be another day. You hear me? There's going to be a better day. And kind of Vic said in his acting things, like that. There's the double truth in our, our counterparts. And that's what I pray for on a daily basis. That those men, those Vic Morrows, those James Garners, God rest his soul, mm -hmm. those guys, those Marlon Brandos, the, we're going to put those people together, men and women of all ages, to save this planet for one another. University of Georgia is like that now. Uh, it's, it's getting there, getting there. After traveling around the world, I don't know if you can uh, notice this. People want to fight, and it's also so good for the, with the with the, uh, the, the, the picket signs. Mm -hmm. But if they win that with, with the picket signs, that's only half of their success. So it's interesting, as you, as you talked about, that, 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 that season of Roots. Yes, sir. And, and I've had so many conversations, again, with Richard Lawson and Lynn Terman and Bill Duke, yeah. uh, Jack Great. A and others. And, and the reason why I think the stories are important mm -hmm. and why we have to hear them so people understand that when they turn that television on today, mm -hmm. when they go to the big screen and they see these movies and shows, understand it was a long battle, struggle, oh, yeah. fight to get that, to, to, to get to even just where we are today. Right. Well, we've got other options now. We can just open our mouth and we're on screen. <clears throat> you know, I, I'm, I'm uh, flirting with the story of Mary McLeod Bethune. Mm -hmm. So I heard about Mary McLeod Bethune's friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt mm -hmm. and became real tight real quick because her husband was dying of alcoholism. So she came up one day to the White House and he was in the wheelchair with a blanket. And she grabbed the blanket, pulled the bottle, and he went like this and she said, it's a true story. Uh, I'm going to give this back to you, but here's first what I want you to do first is I want you to integrate the armed forces because we're losing the war. And FDR said, no, they're not capable. He said, I don't care what you say. Call Ike. So he calls Ike and says, I want to integrate the army. He said, those people are not prepared. I don't care. We're going to integrate the war. Tuskegee Airmen, 135th Regiment Armory, Harlem, and five others. And so we're going to put them on the, the world's biggest bigots in the United States Army. It was Patton. He said, give him the Patton business. I'll take care of that. Leave them to me. North Africa, El Qaim. Uh, then they get their, their reputation as, as chess masters. He was a chess master. He was about to annihilate the British in El Qaim in North Africa. There's one last spot for him to go before he says, charge. A young Tuskegee Airman looked out the window and said, wait a minute, that's the such and such maneuver. Called the tank battalion and said, go to that place and don't give it up. As a result of them not giving it up, they beat Field Marshal Rommel, sent him up through Italy, back to Berlin, calling the people to spots. Where did it get started? The friendship of Mary McLeod Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt. So when FDR died, Eleanor Roosevelt was responsible for uh, the United Nations, Ralph Bunch, A. Philip Randolph, uh, 
Walter White and others. She was in the middle of all of that. Mm -hmm. Mary McLaughlin. That's the story that we have to tell. Right. And there's so many like it. Because uh, there was supposed to be dangerous if we knew. It's essential that we all know now. Right. I mean, to me, it's dangerous yeah. if we don't know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. More people didn't know, need to know about you. I've known you for many years. Yes, I remember. I remember. You and Al. And you're, you're necessary. <laughs>
just wanted to listen to him and just ask him questions and just. Well, I was, I was adopted. I was 17 years old on Broadway in 1953. Not supposed to be possible. Mm -hmm. Straight in high school. So the people that used to come and bring me sandwiches was Adam Clayton Powell and Hazel Scott. Mm. Um, Paul Robinson, when he was in town, he was so happy to see this young kid in the show business, he went to tears. He would laugh, and he'd shake your hand, and his fingers were by my elbow. He was a big, right. wonderful, big boy. That's what he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was uh, Hazel Scott, who was in the play with me, Take a Giant Step. Frederick O'Neill, the first black president of the Actors' Equity. Estelle Hemsley. I had the Max, Max Glanville. There was some very nice people used to come and bring me my sandwiches, my barbecue from Harlem. And uh, so that was, oh my goodness. Wilt, I was hanging out with Wilt a lot. Uh, I was the kid on the block. Mm -hmm. I was so spoiled, man. I was so spoiled. So my great grandma came up one day and she says, uh, oh, grandma, you came, you made it. And she slapped me. And then there's a room full of famous people, right? Right. I said, well, you slapped me. She slapped me again. She says, I taught you how to be respectful for your grandma. And I didn't see that up there. I said, no, no, that's a play. <laughs> that's a play. She said, I don't care. <laughs> and I'm going to come back next week, make sure you don't say it again, right? Wow. Now Paul Robes is on the floor in stitches. <laughs> You're like, I'm acting. And I said, somebody else is like, I don't care. She said, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there's a lot of little stories like that. that so. That's hilarious. Yeah. So You're like, why did you slap me? Culture clash. <laughs> Paul Robinson was like a kid. If he saw something like that, he'd, he'd be in tears. He'd laugh so hard. Great man. I, I think out of Josephine all... Josephine Baker, another one. Out of all the figures, when I think about activists and even entertainment, mm -hmm. fundamentally, Robeson is... I think the top of the list of top. completely underrated. Oh my God. And not fully, I mean, it, 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 for one, just the athletic feats. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, Jack the, Johnson alone. Being a lawyer and the, I mean, just, mm -hmm. I mean, but when you just think about central figures of the, of the 20th century, I hate that more people really don't understand. He still has yet to be really honored. Yeah. He's yet to be really, really honored. But there's a man. Kofi, I'll send them to you if you like, and you'll see, you'll see Paul Robeson in front of you. Mm -hmm. He does a, a one-man show, mm. and you should probably meet that young man. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, it's nice to be this age, very grateful to be unscathed, uh, broken legs and stuff, you know, and all my had sports injuries. And, but I've been given uh, the opportunity by God, my God, God, to to be in Israel and Africa and Japan and Australia and Egypt and South America and Central America and Mexico, Canada, in 80 years. There's no career out there that long. I have nothing to complain about. Mm -hmm. I wake up the next morning, you got me another one? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, God. Thank you. It's good to see you. I've been in the place where I've I was concerned, and it gets you angry, and then finally you take a deep breath, and say, well, wait a minute. You can't do nothing about it except speak your mind and mm -hmm. get on with the day. But it's, uh, it's a good time to be alive. When you, um, how do you, well, let me phrase it this way. What still excites you about either the stage, the small screen, or the big screen? What still makes you just, let's go? New talent. New talent. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, my favorite actress is Taraji Henson. And another one is, is uh, the girl that played my daughter in The, the Watchmen. Uh, I can't remember right now what her name is. King. And uh, there's some... Regina King. Regina and others. Writers. The director from, from uh, let's call it Purple, uh, Fantasia. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some people out there that's very exciting. And, and it's in, in all walks of life. Athletes, amazing. That kid uh, from New Orleans. Uh, he's, he's amazing. 
So, so when you do it with these projects, so for you, it's it's being able to share space with this with this I'm, new I'm blessed. I'm blessed, and it's a mutual. I don't know. We don't have that kind of time, but I tell you, I must felt so cell phone. All the thanks and congratulations, the mutual family over the last couple of years that uh, I've been fortunate to, to be around. The respect is there. They like it when we contribute some knowledge to them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're out there saying, what's next? They're brilliant. But it's, it's, it's the old days when we, had, we created the original gangbanger and the original uh, gangster. Mom was on the phone too long. The kid was on a, in a high chair with the food, and the food went on the floor. So he came out in the street and said, pay attention, pow, pow. And they're really doing it now. But most of them uh, are still here, and they're salvageable. And they'll take their cell phones, eventually, and put it in their back pocket, and listen. That's a blessing. And I have to, I'm, I'm very proud to have a semblance of a relationship with those young people. Harry Belafonte. I love that man. I, as well. Yeah. As well. Mr. B. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. When he had convened uh, a meeting of the elders. Yes, sir. And it was here in Atlanta. Yes, sir. And, and he talked about this in his documentary. He says that as he was sitting there, as he was sitting there listening to all the elders, he said it hit him. I don't need to be in this room. And that's when he then purposely went out and began to go find young people mm -hmm. and to engage them and talk to them. Yes, sir. Because uh, he said the solutions for the future are not going to be solved in the room with elders. He says we got to be able to be Touch. interacting with young. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's so many stories to tell you. We, have, we need a lot of time to do that. My, my lifetime friend with Floyd Patterson. Uh, he, he was the El, El Diablos, Bedford Stop. Stingy brim hats, satin jackets. And I, I had uh, my cousins, the El, El something, El Quintos. And I, I, I came and went so far to the wrong neighborhood. And the gang had me up against the wall. And somebody said, get out of the way. And the man took a zip gun about this big with a big fat rubber band and put it in my, between my eyes like this, and we looked eye to eye, they pulled the trigger, and the rubber band broke. Now, the Guinness Book of Records does not have the fastest 10 blocks in history. I still hold that record. <laughs> <laughs> you know who that man was? Who? Oh. Floyd Patterson. Wow. Before he went to the Woodward School, and we became close. Yeah, we became close after that? Yes. I told him, he remembers me, and I remember him. Man. Yeah, that's a story, yeah. Yeah, that is a story. Yeah, he almost killed me, but the rubber band broke. That's divine intervention. Absolutely. Yeah, we used to run the Greenwood Lake before the championships. Quite a man. Quite now, how did y'all go from that to friends? Well, because we, we looked at each other and said, I don't remember you. He said, yeah, you remember me. I remember you. Why would you remember me? And I told him, he said, yeah, that was me. Him and his brother ran the El Diablos. His brother died in Sing Sing. Mm. And he went to Whitwick School for Boys. And you like, thank God that rubber band. Tell me, tell, yes, sir. I went thick red, red rubber bands and things said, oing, 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 oing. and my butt said, oing, oing, oing. <laughs> I'm Brooklyn. I come from there, from that old area. It's amazing. The life is really nice. I'm very great, grateful. When you think about moments like that, mm -hmm. um, and it happens to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it, it's always interesting to me when folks say, well, it, it, it just happened. I'm like, no, 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 no. That was a message. God knows what you were destined for. Yes, sir. And um, what's sad to me is when, um, when I see, especially when I see a story of another young Brother, young rapper, shot and killed. The brothers at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffle House. Yeah. Um, take off. Cats are sitting here playing a dice game, and it just and when it happens, the, for me, what 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 comes up is, or even, you know, the DJ Twitch mm -hmm. takes his life at forty, 
Mm. I always think about, I always think about what, what the world miss, miss, misses when, when these lives are, are taken so young. And so when I hear that story, mm. I mean, all the things that happen after that yeah. well, you, would have you, never transpired. You pray on it very hard. And I think their messages, God is giving us messages hard and soft. So sometimes we need to hear a hard message to get our attention and blink our eyes to do something about it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very grateful to still be alive, to open my mouth, to, uh, to, to do that. Every now and then I can't get up in the morning. I'm, I'm 86, you know. But as soon as I can, I'm up, you know. I've got some nice people working with me and for me. To help me do that. So you just said you said open your mouth, and the thing that I say this all the time to, to journalists or mm. or even media personalities, I tell them you need to respect this microphone. Yes, sir. And I said, what I mean by respect it, you, you don't. You need to understand the power of it. How literally what you say mm. could alter someone's thinking, could change their mind, yeah. could change the direction of their lives. I had a, when I ran Tom Joyner's site, blackamericanweb.com, mm -hmm. um, I was the founding editor. And we didn't have a praise and worship channel. Mm. And I said, well, you can't have a black website and you have a praise and worship channel. Mm -hmm. So I created it. And I wrote a column one day, and I literally cannot remember what it was. Mm -hmm. And a woman sent me an email. A woman sent me an email. And she said, you know, I, li I listen to Tom's show, and I hear this every day. She, you, she said, I, I listen to his show, and I, I keep hearing him talk about this website every day. Gotcha. And she said, and I never went to the website. But today, I decided to go to the website. And she said, and then I went to this channel, and then I saw what you wrote, and I read what you wrote. <clears throat> she said, I want you to understand something. She said, I had already planned my suicide. She said, I had already, um, I had already planned it. I, I knew when. I knew how. And I was simply waiting for that day. She said, yet, I read what you wrote. And now I understand that there's a purpose for my life. Mm. Now, when I told that story, somebody was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. I said, I said, no. I said, let me flip it. I said, what you need to understand is if God told me to write it and I never wrote it, that's she a sin. would have never read it. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said, so the piece for us is when we have to say something to somebody, I said, say it because you do not know who is being sent to hear it. Absolutely. I, I, I find here in Georgia, what I say to you sometimes doesn't fall right on, on black or white ears. Right. Because they want things to stay as they are and slowly uh, uh, grow. But if they want to stop me by killing me or shutting me down, they're shutting down somebody who's going to save their life tomorrow. Mm -hmm. This doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. That old, I'm better than you are, is, doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
The, the media is the second most powerful medium in the world. Mm -hmm. You see a coup anywhere in the world is the guns, is the military first, media is always second. Yes, sir. So what you do, what I do is so powerful because we literally, what we do goes around the world. Absolutely, now, especially now. And people are forming mm -hmm. opinions and perspectives based upon what they see. So that movie, yeah. that, that uh, radio project, mm -hmm. uh, that broadcast, I mean, we literally People could can change minds. That's what happened. And that's why I say, folk, don't mm -hmm. take lightly mm -hmm. that power that you have. It's, and some, some of it's new. Some of it's new. They had the, 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 the one television. You must have been a teenager uh, when television was in New York City. You, you, the Goodwill and, and uh, East Side, West Side. And that's where Sicily and all those people came mm -hmm. from. So I did a thing called the Nurses. And that's a, I played a juvenile delinquent that gets shot in the stomach. And uh, at the end, I'm running from the cops, and my, the, the stitches break. And I die. They put it away. I get my first job in Kenya and Tanzania. So I get off the plane, and I raise the award, and the so I get out, and I get in the car and go to the Hilton. By the time I get to the Hilton, the traffic has stopped. This young man says, could you do me a favor? I said, yeah. He says, open your shirt. So I went up the shirt. How did you do that, sir? How did I do what? How did you come back to life? That's the early television. Series. Wow. That's the story. We had Joe Kenyatta as president. His wife did the same. How did you do that? They didn't know about acting. They right. know now. So like a great-grandmother. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some stories that does in my book. I'm but sorry. that's the power, and, and that's why, you know, it's, 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 it's like, though, no, understand that even if it's a movie and it's fiction, mm -hmm. the words that you speak, the role that you play, someone is watching. Yes, it is. That's new for me. And someone is paying yeah. attention. Yeah. And literally, one scene mm -hmm. could just completely yeah. alter someone's view. Yeah, because I was, I've been told across the South. So it's supposed to be dangerous down here. I mean, some of the guys, some of the cops. I said, I, you really helped raise me an officer, gentleman. I had a sergeant just like you. And he said, what has changed my life? He just comes to my house sometime. And uh, under other circumstances, he'd be on the other side of the street. Maybe his father was, but uh, not me and him. When, when you, speaking of that, When you were doing that movie, were you thinking about and an understanding the, the racial implications of this hardcore, stern black officer? The officer gentleman? Yeah. And, and, and how mm -hmm. folk would react to it? Well, no, because the officer gentleman. I was, going to, I was getting a fart. There's a break for me. They, they fired a, a, a white actor and paid him off because somebody had done some research and say 90% of the DIs teaching the, the, the naval officers to be pilots are black. So initially, so initially, that was a white actor? Initially, it was a white actor. I can't remember his name, but <clears throat> I, I, I think I can remember. And, and it was a, 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 a tribute to Richard Gere. He was Mr. Goodbar. He was the new movie star. So he was ready to do that and be the lead and beat up the Marine and you know, win the girl and all that stuff. And the Marine showed up with me after six weeks of rehearsal of, 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 of I became, I was a DI when I showed up. It was my shot, you know? The DI said, oh, no, that's not what we do. So slowly as we did it on a daily basis, the Marines let them say what's real. How do you make a man out of a man? I don't care what color you are, what religion. You gotta to listen to these rules. I'm your DI. Now for you, yes. what was it like to transform into that? Oh, it was, in, in a way it was a secret pleasure. <laughs> because I never got a chance to do it in the streets of Los Angeles. And I got legally ability, the ability to tell the movie star to get down and give me 50. I want your DOR. So that whatever is it was in my system, 
I was able to legally, legally do it for Taylor Hackley. So sort of like when, when Jamie Foxx played in Django Unchained. Yes, sir. When, so, so for you, it was like, okay, all of this that black folk yeah. been carrying. The director said, let him have I'm, it. I'm about to take it out on Richard Yow. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> did did, did he understand that? Great professional actor, because he went for it. That's why it's such a good movie. So you took all of that, our history, and, and subjugation, and having to yeah. bow down, and... They and should have the Oscar, the Marines. They would not let us lie about them in that movie. They tried to fight for, for a week that Richard would win the fight. No. And they said, that don't happen in real life? No, 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 no. That, that should be their Oscar. Because they pushed me right through, representing them. So I said, we just had a birthday a couple months ago, the Marines' birthday. I'm a Marine. Do Marines still yes, sir. come up to you? Yes, sir. And every foreign country has got an embassy, and it's manned by the Marines. So I'm an honorary Marine. And I represent the Montford Point Marines. Uh -huh. you know, so it's it's very good feeling, very secure feeling. Very so, secure. So many actors want that Academy Award. Mm -hmm. Did it mean that much to you? Was it validation? Or, or for you, did you say, I don't need the award to validate me? Well, I, I needed validation. Oh, even today, I, I sink into that low self-esteem. I'm old now, you know, I forget my lines and stuff. And I see, I, in my mind, I see them with the scissor. That's it. That's me. Right. But uh, I'm just very grateful. I'm grateful. I'm still there. I did the... Uh, not as good a job as I thought I would do on The Color Purple. I played that and, and others. I forgot my lines. And, but it's there. It's still there. I was born with it. Whenever I ask musicians or actors this question, typically it's something that we don't, wouldn't associate as their favorite. Um, some people hate when I have to ask this. When I ask this question, like, oh, it's like picking your favorite child. So I ask it this way: What role have you relished the most? Just it, just you, just even thinking about it now, it makes you just feel great when you think about that role. Enemy mind. Five and a half of make five and a half hours of makeup. Looks like a lizard. Come from another planet. Most difficult job I've ever had to do. Storyline. Those enemies become friends, lifetime friends. And he has a baby. And the philosophy of the story between Dennis Quaid's character and my character became two lifetime brothers. And uh, I had six months in Germany. That's was, that was amazing stuff. Everybody turned it down because it was so hard. Mm -hmm. You know, Dennis, 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 uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman wants to play it, but it's too hard. I said, like, yeah, hand it here. I went down to Munich and ate, ate the food, the sauerbrot, and, and uh, got a lot of sleep and got in good shape. And the philosophy of that movie, if you see it, Galip defined, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. We were chatting before the camera's rolling, and we were talking about Glenn Turman. Oh, yeah. And my baby brother. The folks, just the cast and the raising in the sun. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, when you think back and reflect on Sir Sidney. Oh, yes, sir. What comes to mind? Love, respect, honor, role model, best friend, uh, benevolent, brilliant, uh, smooth, him and Harry. And I, I fought him and Harry and Sammy for a while. Another one of them I would name Leon Bibb, mm -hmm. Roscoe Lee Brown. I followed them around faithfully because they had something to offer. Maya, Cicely was my leading lady. She was a lot of leading ladies. And an actress by the name of Beverly Todd. Mm -hmm. That society. She's still around. The world's mm -hmm. still around. Something was very rich about those people. And I stuck, stuck with them as much as possible. The thing to me with Portier, 
Mm-hmm. Just the word presence. It was, it, was, it, was, it was just always just interesting. And the few times I was in a room just to watch how others would approach him. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, and it, it really was. Royalty. It, that's exactly what it was. Mm-hmm. Well, that's exactly what it was. And he did it for himself. So upon Roos listening to radio and television, learning how to get rid of that accent, and he, he did it for himself. He did it. And that's to be respected. I miss him terribly. But right behind him was me, following along with him. Mm-hmm. It was hard for me not to act like him. He was so good. Really? He was that good, yeah. Another one that I talk about that not enough people talk about is Woody Strode. Mm. You remember Woody Strode at all? Mm-mm. Remember a film called uh, Sergeant Rutledge? Woody Strode. Woody Strode, S-T-R-O-D-E. Um, you come to my house, I'll show you a picture, painting of me and him, and a picture I did called Gathering of Old Men. Ernest Gaines did it. The first thing he did was Jane Pittman, mm-hmm. Sisley. Second one was Gathering of Old Men. Mm-hmm. Now, Woody Strode went to UCLA, All-American. Um, he was all-star football player, track star, and he was nominated for an Academy Award in a thing called Sergeant Rutledge. And um, then he was sent to Italy, where he could do some work. So he did Dimitris and the Gladiators with, with uh, Kirk Douglas. And he stayed there and did a lot of movies. Just look him up. He was my hero. Woody Stroll. Yeah, he was, uh, there's some great ones out there, man. Some of them are still alive. Great ones. When um, you were talking about Glenn Turman and uh, y'all, y'all's relationship. Yeah. Um, the thing that, uh, when, I last talk, when I last talked to him, uh, is that um, I still crack up that, that Glenn. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, Glenn, I, I, how are you from Harlem? And you swear he, 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 he a Southern cowboy, um, you know. And, and, and it's, it's, I, I get a kick out of that. And he said that his his great his greatest dreams. I said, what's that one thing you want to do? And he said, a real true black western. Ooh. So I ask you, is there something that you have always wanted to do, but you have yet to do, and what is that? What a question. The character that I always wanted to play has been played. I don't think it was good enough, but it's still there. The Bass Reeves story. Bass Reeves was the most successful marshal in the history of the West. Mm-hmm. And always got his man except for one. I've got a, a photograph of him in my, my, love, in my office. There's some other stories. Uh, I'm, I'm working on uh, the, a man by the name of Colonel Hubert, the Black Eagle Julian. You know that name at all? Mm-hmm. Well, you know... C- Colonel uh, Hubert? Hubert Fauntleroy Julian is the Black Eagle. Mm. So now he, he is the Black Star, shipping lines. Right. So how Marcus Garvey got his black people out of Harlem to go to Jamaica first before they, they went to Liberia. Mm-hmm. They used the Black Star lines. It was owned by Colonel Julian. Mm-hmm. Colonel Julian had, had a little biplane, and, and the Red Baron called him a Schwarzer. And he challenged the, the man in the, in the middle of the English Channel and sent him home. <laughs> and so he was one of those people. They've taken him out of the history books of Marcus Garvey. If it wasn't for him, Marcus Garvey couldn't have gotten to Liberia. Mm. It was his stuff. He supplied all the Cause weapons. Because most people, when they, when they, when they, yeah. if they do, first of all, if anybody talks about Marcus Garvey, yes, it's, it's, even if they talk about that, and they mention the Black Star Cruise Line. Yes, that's, that's I, Colonel Julian. Like, literally. Yeah. That name never comes up. They take it out. I want to put it back. It's a very special Jamaican, both of them Jamaican. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause 
to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. history um, you too yeah it, it's you know all of those stories are so important yes sir. Uh, just to understand how things happened and and how and 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 you know the intersection and and how things how, how things were connected mm-hmm. and you know I, i've given speeches and i'm i, I wouldn't i've mentioned someone i mentioned someone's name people are like oh my god I never heard that yeah and and it shows you how so much of our history is just completely untold. I mean, there, there, are, yeah. there are just troves of names and stories that are worth telling. Oh, yeah. Whether documentaries, whether movies, or whatever. There's a, this family, it's called the Jackson family, I think, outside of Tulsa, when they bombed Tulsa. That's right. They were missed because they were not in Tulsa, just on the outskirts. Mm, they weren't in Greenwood. They weren't in Greenwood, wow. right outside. And they still have the property. I'm trying to get that done. So I don't want to ask anybody else. I want to ask us. We have to have this network so that these young people know how prolific the history yeah. is. Good well, and bad. Well, that's why, so it's just, so just so you know, um, I was working with some folks, and we were we hired these marketers come up with a name for my my network, and um, and I, I expressly told them, don't come back to me with an African name. Here's why, I said, I don't want to have to have to explain the name of the network while I'm trying to explain to you what the network is. Yes, I hear you. That's why I did that. That's a d- distraction. So it wasn't. It wasn't like mm-hmm. okay. I'm just mm-hmm. okay. I don't. I don't want an African name. Mm-hmm. I said, but I said I got finite time to explain the network. Mm-hmm. I can't try to be trying to explain the name and then explain the network. Yeah. So they came back with these names. I'm like, I told you I don't do this. <laughs> and so one of my guys, he's like, Look, baby, we got you the name. Now I just come come back from Ghana from the year of return, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, I had I did I took a photo um, above the. Um, Black Star Gate, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and I was sitting there, and I was, and it just, again, I had spent probably ten grand with his marketing group, and came up with the name literally that quick, and the reason I saw so my OTT network is called Black Star Network. Gotcha. And the reason, and the reason, because so why did Garvey want to do that? Because he wanted to connect the African diaspora. Yes, sir. And so my whole deal was, it's the same thing with, with the network. Mm. And, and what I tell people is what literally what you just said, because mm-hmm. uh, people come in after TV one and like, oh man, I wish you go back to CNN. I wish you had a show on MSNBC. And I said, I'm not interested in asking someone else for permission to tell our story. I agree. And it's, I said, it's not revolutionary. No, it's necessary. I said I want to be able yeah. to say yes, no, yeah. and being able to own the cameras and being able to. Say no, we're going to go here. Right. So yeah, we're going to go to Liberia for two weeks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're going to go. We're going to go That's here. That's exciting. We're going to go. We, we spent six days in Tulsa covering the gotcha. anniversary of the uh, of the race massacre. Mm. And to me, that that that's really it. It's it's having the freedom mm-hmm. to not ask somebody else for, for permission. permission. For permission. Because we got so yeah. many stories. Oh, so many stories. So many stories. Uh, so many. We can talk for hours on those stories. I've done research on all my career. That's close to 70 years. 
all of them were turned down except here recently. Mm -hmm. But uh, now's the time. Because he's got universities, he's got audiences. Yeah. It's programs like this. And awesome. the thing, the key is the gatekeepers no longer control access. You know, it's, it's a different world game. And that's it's that's why I game. love to see Nali, I love to see what's happening in Nigeria. Yeah, Nali to was see, tough last time. Yeah. You know, I just love to see how African nations and how folks in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, how young filmmakers mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the United States who are, 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 are taking this phone mm -hmm. and creating, you know, art, yeah. uh, full, you know, full, full scale uh, movies. And, and that's, that's the thing that I, I tell people, young and old. People come up to me and they say, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, but, but I can't afford all of this. And I say, listen. That's gotten so sophisticated. I said, this, yeah. this right here, that's, I said, start here. Mm -hmm. I said, do not let the inability to purchase all of this mm -hmm. keep you from telling the story. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've enjoyed this, by the way. Thank well, you. Well, you know, we, we've been waiting for a long time we've to do it. Yeah, we've been, yeah, but we've gone through changes. Also. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now is the time. Absolutely, absolutely. Now is the uh, time. Your book. Yes, sir. You call it an actor and a gentleman. Mm -hmm. um, I always ask anyone who writes a book this, even if, even when they wrote it, was there a wow moment? So even when you were writing and researching and remembering, <clears throat> what was that moment where you went, wow? Oh, yeah. I could count them, but the biggest, if you have time. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't work in... We South got time. I, okay. own, I own it. Okay, got it. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't go to South Africa until Mandela was going to, throw, to come out of prison. Right. I've been invited. I did a good man in Africa, you know. But the first movie produced independently after Mandela was coming out of prison was a thing called The, 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 the Reason. And uh, it's, it's kind of a throwback of the Truth Commission. So... I moved to, to uh, South Africa, and I'm, I'm having a good hot and cold places, people watching over corners and stuff, but I'm looking around. I learned to meet the uh, Mandela's and, uh, and the, the godfather of the uh, ANC, uh, the Tambo family. Mm -hmm. And in the Tambo family was the heir apparent after Mandela would retire. It was Chris H-A-N-I, Hani. Mm -hmm. He was dating his niece, an albino... I, I'd still be there. She'd, she'd have me by the throat. She was so, so pretty. Oh, God. I was, I moved in. I was moving in. She, uh, she, uh, she, she took your heart, huh? Oh, God. The whole culture. The whole culture. So now, Chris Honey was, uh, and then they celebrated his, his success at this football stadium. There was a man behind him saying, stop firing. They were shooting guns. And his name was Chris Honey. He was in the government. One morning, a white woman, and a man shot Chris Honey in the chest seven times. So when you do that, and here in Georgia, you go to this flower man, and you bring the flowers to the to the mom, the mom, you know, to the wife. That's all I was thinking about. My driver, he's a former football player with Jerry Curl, and we got on the freeway, went to the Honey household, and when we look up, we're surrounded. On the left is all the white guys with their tanks. And on the right side is all the young blacks with their little swords and stuff. We can't back up. Can't go forward. The heart's going boom, da boom. That's it. You're like, what did I walk into? What did into? I walk into, right? So I took a deep breath, got the flowers out, and started walking toward the house. And they got out the way. Heart's going boom. That's all I could hear was boom, da boom, boom. And things on the radio, walkie talkie. So finally I got there knocking on the door. My friend Dolly Tambo, you know that name, Dolly Tambo? Mm -hmm. He, uh, that's part of that family. He opened up, grabbed me, and says, Get in here. I said, What happened? He says, you, You're crazy. You just walked into the, the, the mouth of, of the devil. They're gonna, they're, they're, you not, may not live. I mean, he was very upset. So while I'm here, can I give this flowers to, to the missus? And I took her, she looked at me and like I was nuts. Three or four hours later, Oliver Tambo, the godfather of the ANC, mm -hmm. Adelaide, his wife, 
She said, I think I'm going to try and see if I can get you back to the hotel. So she goes out and she speaks, oh, three hours. And uh, she cried, spoke in three or four different languages. She was on the ground, <laughs> whatever she was saying. And she came back exhausted, soaking wet. She says, I think maybe you can try it now. So <laughs> my man, Jerry Curl's gone. <laughs> The football player, yeah, Jerry Curry, gone. Yeah, he's gone. He's got screwed. So now we get in the car, and we're followed all the way, th- halfway to this Satin, Satin Sun, name of the hotel. And we got there. I can take a deep breath. That's a wow. Yeah. That's a wow. Coming back to do a good man in Africa, the white people, I'm the first ones off the plane. I said, oh, they, they haven't forgotten so he grabs me and tells me that he was one of the soldiers. His name was Hilgar, I think his name was, from, from, from New Zealand. And uh, he took me off the plane first. And uh, after that, he said, uh, I want to tell you a story. He was in one of those tanks. Mm. And his commander said, put that man in your horse crosshairs. So that's one of the stuff I heard from the walkie-talkie. And all of a sudden, I came close, and it's called, they said, oh, no, no, wait a minute. That's Lou Gossett Jr., a white Dutch man. So the life was saved because of the movies. Wow. Otherwise, I'd be dead. And that's two times. There's more than what? More you, than that. Wow. Yeah, that's a wow. Yeah. A white Dutchman yeah. gets the order Put that black man in your cr- in crosshairs. In your crosshairs. And he does. It he goes, was assigned when hey, he came back. As that's Lou Gossett Jr. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. He, thank, became, he became my bodyguard. Thank God for the big screen. Tell me something. There you go. There you go. That is a, that's yeah. Wild. That's that, that's a wild moment. Yeah. I, I, I want to go back. I want to go the back. The only thing I would regret was that Zulu girl. See, that's what I was going to See, I, see, I, see, I, see, I, I was going back because it was... <laughs> What is it? When you said it, I was just, I was like, you know what? He, he thinks on this. <clears throat> what is it about a woman that captivates a man? That, I, don't, I don't want to figure it out. I just want to be happy it's there. I mean, just, just, yeah. I mean, the idea of you wake up thinking about them, mm-hmm. you think about them all day, yeah. you go to sleep, you go to sleep, you want to see their face. It, 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 it is. It's, it's just a fascinating... It's, it's old. It's as old as people. Because back in Africa, there's, there's no husbands and wives. There's tribes. And the job to do for the main benefit of the whole. So it's a free feeling. Yeah. See, I was, ha- I, was, uh, so I was having a conversation the other day with a friend of mine. And we were talking about this. And he said, there's a difference between Loving someone, mm-hmm. being in love with someone, mm-hmm. and desiring someone. Yeah. Sometimes I think what you, together. huh? Sometimes all three come together. I think what sounds like what you describe it as Zulu woman, all, all, all three converged. Yeah, almost two and a half. Two and a half. Two and a half. So, so she now married to somebody else with a silver mine. So she's all right. She's doing Bridget Mutsepe. But she just huh, she, she, she took me took me right off the ground. You know, that was it. You know. Bad mistake. I should have stayed there and fought for her. <laughs> I mean, you had the Dutch but, bodyguard. But I, have, I have no complaints though, man. Everything's okay. It's okay. I'm an old man now. I can reflect and be very grateful. Very grateful. We have some contemporaries out there, the the Dion's, and the, I'm okay. I'm okay. Everything's okay. Has it, was it hard? I've, I've, other people, other artists have said this to me that it is very difficult for people who they love, would be their family or a partner, to understand that their craft is actually their most important love. Oh, it's a tough one. That's not racial at all. That's, Has that been the case for you, where your craft is the, that's 
that's just, that's your first marriage, your first love. Once you start getting successful in it and you study the things that you have to go through in order to loosen your instrument to play those parts, to get hired again and be successful globally, first locally and then globally, it's your first marriage. So how do you, how do you, how do you, de- how do you deal with that? How do you deal with... You pray that the, the who you're with understands. They take them with you sometimes when they like the lights and stuff, you know. But, but how do you also even deal with it when... And again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm converging these two forces. When you're with someone, mm-hmm. you're, you have a partner, you're married to someone, mm-hmm. and then you have this love, and then you encounter someone else. Oh, it's a tough who, one. Happens. Yeah. Who takes your breath away. Yeah. Because, the, 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 and that's the thing that I think a lot, again, when, 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 when that thing is what mm-hmm. you love, and it's, and it's not that, it's not, to me, it's not even that you crave the attention. No. But it's just that when you know that this is what I was put here for, it, it, it's hard for, it's, someone has to understand that, that look, this, this is one. my thing. That's not Rachel at all. It's not Rachel at all. It's uh, a dynamic. It's tough. Male, male, female, female, male. Female, female, male, male. And there were many times that you had to pick? When you had to make clear? You, yeah, you have to be clear. Honor your, 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 your reason why you're, why you're traveling, what you have to do in front of your audience. Uh, uh, so it's more than doing the movie. You have to push it. You have to be present. You have to be charming. And every now and then, God steps in there with his little devilish arrow. And uh, that's what happens. That's what happens with uh, some of them, you know. That's what happened probably with uh, one of the greatest athletes, uh, O.J. and uh, and uh, the man with the bad leg, Hollywood, Dion. Mm-hmm. Those are my heroes, you know. Walt Frazier. Uh, some great ones out there. <laughs>conversations. So I'm, I'm at the Jeffrey Osborne Golf Tournament, <clears throat> and it gets rained out. Massive storm comes through. So we're sitting at the table, and sitting around talking, and so I'm sitting here, and Amar Rashad is sitting here, and Eddie LaVert is sitting here, mm-hmm. and Barry Bonds is sitting here, wow. and Sugar La- Ray Leonard is sitting right here. And we're having this discussion about greatness. Mm. Because because I brought up something Eddie's singing, and I brought up, and he was talking about, man, you're the smartest guy on television. And so so we're, and he's asking me questions, and then we're talking, Ahmad is talking about what it requires to be a great wide receiver, and then Barry is talking about what it means to be a, a, a great baseball player. And then Sugar Ray Leonard is talking about what it means to be a great boxer, and, and he says something, he says, man, you've been a great boxer. I was like, are you out your mind? He said, no, 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 no. He said, last night we were on stage and I saw you dancing. He said, all I could do is look at your feet. He said, was right. your, he was like, is your footwork? Yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, no, your footwork. He said, I thought you were all that twisted. Turn. Are you going to fall down? I said, first of all, to be a boss, you got to take a punch. I ain't letting nobody hit me. I said, footwork is great. But it was just this fascinating discussion we had. Oh, my God, I wish a camera was rolling. And it was just a whole discussion about greatness. Mm-hmm. Um... Have you had those conversations with peers or people you respect where, where, where you wanted to just, no, I need to know 
what does it require to be great, to become a legend, become an icon? And I have the slightest idea. It's good, good fortune. Blessed by God. Uh, you look at it, reflect, you reflect on it, and it's uh, almost like bingo. Mm. You prepare for it. The best you can do to prepare for it, and each day you get better and better. Never wanted to quit? Did you yeah, ever? quite a few times, yeah. We're not getting How ready. close did you come? I wanted to, uh, there was a time when I had to be, choose between basketball and sports early on, baseball and sports, and then uh, I got work. And every time I would threaten to quit, i get a job. So I was making somebody else some money, so they didn't want that to happen, I guess. But I've gotten the good fortune of bringing my children, who are still upset, but they came with me to nine and ten different universities and countries. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one. It's a you tough say one. still upset? They're still upset they didn't have a check. It's, and I think father and son or father and daughter is much more quality than that. It's, it's the hands-on relationship, the way it was, would be back in the, in the days of the tribes. Any regrets? No. no, no, I don't. I, I'd question God if I did that. Yeah, this is one great big sandwich. You know, there's some things. Uh, if you do that, then you can't live today. One role that I do, and I have a DVD, Satchel Page. Oh boy, that was fun. That was fun in Mississippi. Yeah, he was there when we started. Really? Yeah. He was there. Wow. He traveled in the suitcase, two suitcases. His dishes, all stuff is in one, in two suitcases. Uh, Beverly Todd was my wife, my wife. Again, Paige, another one of those, people talk about Jackie Robinson, they talk about, mm -hmm. uh, but Paige was just unbelievable. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was, uh, he should have been the first. Black, but he was 60 years old at the time. Great athlete, though. Smart. Josh Gibson. Um, the second baseman. Wee Willie from the Black League. I yeah, yeah. I, 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 um, the, 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 the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. it just as he died last year. Great, great performances. Great people. Josh you, Gibson, all of them. You, you, you cross paths with so many people. Yes, sir. Yeah. Very grateful. Who would you say, and Grant, you got lots of choices. That was just absolutely fascinating. Anwar Sadat. I had to play him. Mm -hmm. There's very little uh, look on him on films for him speaking. So I was invited. He collected black artists, mm. Roots, the whole private library. Which is how I got to play his part by his wife, Jihan. Fascinating man. He was more black than anything else because he's a Nubian. Yes, yes. And uh, his feelings were very deep. Oh, I remember vividly. Yeah. I was in the eighth grade. Was assassinated. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I remember vividly. that moment when he decided to go to Israel and get off the plane and go to Israel. How deep that decision had to be. Yeah, I remember the movie. I remember watching you in the movie. That was. Yeah. Yeah, I was always fascinated by the Sadat, because again, you, my dad watched news all the time. And so you're always watching news, and you're like, who was who this black man? Yeah, he was a great man, great man, great man. The two of them, Ben-Gurion and Sadat, and Golda Meir, the whole area. It's a very historical area that God has seen fit for me to participate as, as, as uh, Sadat, as a uh, Egyptian uh, culture, I suppose the other culture of Africa, going there after the Six Day War with Tony Curtis on that way, going back for Iron Eagle one and two, another way. So I can go there now. I don't know, but last time I went, I didn't even need a, a passport, and they're killing one another. <laughs> so it's something about God's influence mm -hmm. on us. That we have to take advantage of. Favorite African nation? Ghana. Why? Um, I don't know. I like this style. I like this style. Then, then Ghana, Sierra Leone, Ivory Coast, 
that whole section. If you come to places like in Georgia and Florida and south of North Carolina, you see very people who look like they come from the same family, mm -hmm. which means that they got a whole tribe. They all came off the boat and sold in one area. Everybody looks like cousins. Right. They're all the same tribe. That has the good, good, good answer. And then the, 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 the one that was not expected is if you have the whole tribe put together, watch out, they're going to come back together <laughs> and do their old roots and stuff. And that's happening. 100 years from now, as going to be a kid, mm -hmm. it's going to be clicking through. And they're gonna come, gonna come past movies. There might be a bookstore coming past this book, mm -hmm. and they might go, "Luke Gossett Jr." Mm -hmm. They might be googling, might be looking it up, and they're gonna see this long history. They're gonna see these long career. What would you want that? kid a hundred years from now to know who Lou Gossett Jr. was. I want them to get it out of the book. And out of the book hundred years from now would be a, a thumbprint button push. So you can learn about me or Sydney or Harry by going <laughs> uh, we need to do that before we get out in the street from our parents and our grandparents. We have to know who one another is. We all have the same basic family rules, I believe. Uh, we have to honor and obey and respect. Uh, we have to be more like the tribe that forced the man to make us slaves. We had the keys to the kingdom. We had the uh, rule over Russia, the first ones really in America. And, but that's over. We made our mistakes too. We need that respect back. We, first, we have to give it to ourselves. So that keeps that age, that's, that elder relationship, which is what I'm doing, forward is worth. Mm -hmm. 100 years from now, it's going to be easier. Go. So I, that's what I think. I'm not going to be here 100 years enough. But you never know what God does. It's going to be easier, I think, in the not too distant future for, the, for us to talk about Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte and Ruby D. It's not just a, a personal memory. They helped me a great deal. But the, the kids behind me and behind the other kids, it's going to be easier. I just want their curiosity to be strong as mine mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. to know who they are. People you might not know. You know, there's so many, so many, so many. Roxy Roca, Maya Angelou, uh, Raymond St. Jacques, Charles Gordon. Uh, some great ones out there. Uh, these, these kids don't know who they are. Last question for you. <clears throat> <clears throat> we began you talking about God waking you up every day. And when you are doing something, when you are, whether it's with your foundation, whether it's when you're speaking, whether it's a podcast, whether it's when you're acting, Is it your great grandmother or is it someone else who is still there who you want to I don't I don't I want I don't want to say impress. Um but that when you do something, when you work, mm -hmm. you are you're thinking of this person and thanking them for what they put in you. Who is that? My mother? My great grandmother, um, and God. But the elders fed me. Uh, Mary McLeod's uh, counterpart was in the First Baptist Church was Madame C. K. Chappelle. They dressed the same. Uh, the aunts, uh, the, the women, the churches, the black church was very powerful. Those women had the ones got the schools. Uh, they smart, smarter than they, they were expected. They might, some of them might have been maids, but they sure picked up the right things mm -hmm. and gave it to us. So it's a, I'll never forget those women, some of those men, those elders, mm -hmm. 
that I have them to uh, thank on a daily basis. Them and God. That's just gravy time, man. Mm -hmm. This is gravy time. This is the longest existing career of anybody starting in 53. I'm amazed. That's God's work. And me obeying, as, as my great grandma would say, hard head makes a soft behind. You know, that's, uh, I'm very grateful. I'm glad, gr grateful that you offered to talk with me this long. It's, I'm very blessed. Thank you for that. Well, been wanting to do it, and I appreciate that we finally got a chance to do it. to it. Next time you come to my house, and eat. Let's do it. You got it? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right. Bring, bring those hungry brothers with you. Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right.